let's go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, welcome to every uh, welcome to everyone. Um, this is the International People's Tribunal on U.S. Imperialism, uh, Sanctions, Blockades, and Economic Coercive Measures. Um, and this is uh, today's hearing is the second part of our Eritrea hearing, which began yesterday. Um, just a, a brief background: uh, the Eritrea hearing is part of a series of country hearings that we've been doing um, from February uh, through that'll go through July. Um, that will assess the impact of sanctions and U.S. imperialism in general on countries across the global south, across Asia, Africa, um, the Americas, and including also the Pacific. Um, so far to date, we've done hearings on Zimbabwe, uh, North Korea, um, Iran, uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Libya, among other countries, if I'm not forgetting any. And later this month, uh, next week, we'll have a hearing on Gaza. Um, that will be on May 13th. On May 19th, we will have one on Yemen. And then uh, at the end of the month, we'll have one on Haiti, uh, May 27th. But today uh, is, as I said, the second part of our hearing on Eritrea. Eritrea uh, is our one two-part hearing that we have because we have such a rich collection of, uh, of witnesses who will present their um, testimonies uh, regarding sanctions against Eritrea. Um, so with that said, uh, I'd like to actually go ahead and jump right into it today. Um, the structure of our uh, of our hearing, as if you weren't here yesterday, we will have uh, uh, six witnesses present their findings, uh, again, assessing the impact of sanctions. Um, I asked the witnesses to each uh, limit their presentations to around 15 to 20 minutes. And then after that, we will have a set of jurors who will ask, uh, who are respected um, activists, lawyers from around the world, who will ask, uh, all scholars as well, who will ask questions of our witnesses. Um, and if we have time, we will also open up to questions from the general audience. Um, with that said, uh, I think we should go ahead and get started. Uh, our first uh, witness for today is uh, Dr. Sinai and Mariam. Um, Dr. Andamariam is a former judge and now an assistant professor and uh, head of the Department of Law in Eritrea. Um, he earned his uh, LLB from the University of Asmara, his LLM from Georgetown University as a Fulbright Scholar, and his PhD from Maastricht University. Um, he is a member of the editorial team of the Journal of Eritrean Studies and, a, and an advisor to the Minister of Justice of Eritrea. He has published uh, with reputable journals at Oxford University Press, Cam uh, Cambridge University Press, Brill, Taylor and Francis, De Gruyter, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopica, and others. Um, so, the, uh, Dr. Andamariam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Navid. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, thank you for welcoming me and my colleagues to this important event. Uh, I'll just uh, proceed with uh, the presentations that were uh, testimonies that were presented yesterday. I will be um, focusing on the uh, uh, economic impact of these uh, sanctions, uh, particularly US sanctions on the Eritrean economy. And I will highlight uh, this story by selecting a few uh, significant stories uh, from the past 15 to 20 years. Uh, but before I uh, proceed uh, with uh, these examples, I'd like to uh, give some sort of an introductory um, uh, remark on the nature of these uh, economic measures against Eritrea. But some of these uh, uh, economic measures are a, a one-off economic uh, measure or measures, or, or some of them are still continuing. Uh, secondly, some of these measures uh, are imposed or were imposed or continue to be imposed by the United States government directly or assumedly under U.S. influence or in cooperation with the United States by other countries, uh, mostly Western European countries. Thirdly, 
some of these uh, measures are rooted uh, under the 2001 uh, Security United Nations Security Council uh, sanction imposed against Eritrea, which was lifted in November 2018. So some of them are related to this uh, UN Security Council sanction, while some others are independent of these um, UN Security Council sanctions. And, and finally, uh, the nature of these sanctions is such that some of them target specific Eritrean interests like the banking industry or a separate wing of the Eritrean government or even individuals, while some others affect the entire uh, nation, the entire government or state apparatus. So I wanted to give this uh, context to the examples that I will be uh, listing in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, a general remark that I would also like to add is that you will you will observe that these uh, different economic sectors or economic points that have been targeted by these sanctions, although on their face and we we claim that they are legitimate economic activities, but the claim from the side that always impose sanctions is that they have a dual purpose or they, they claim that these activities like banking activities or remittance activities or, or mining activities that I will, I will be discussing, although they look legitimate on face, they might have a dual purpose, in, a dual purpose in a sense of well, they, they claim that they might have some uh, uh, links to, say, activities that they consider to be illegitimate or to be illegal or activities that they consider the Eritrean government to be involved in against international peace and security. So I wanted to give this general context before uh, I give you some, some notable examples. So I've picked three uh, most visible or most significant uh, economic measures taken against um, the Eritrean government, Eritrean state, or individuals, or certain sectors of the Eritrean economy. Uh, let me begin with uh, the first one. The first measure, which has been continuing for a number of years, involves hampering or blocking uh, channels for an international Eritrean uh, taxation system, or channels for uh, a remittance uh, system. So a couple of, of channels. One of them is uh, um, a channel through which the Eritrean government collects a mandatory 2% uh, tax from all Eritreans residing abroad. And the second one is a remittance channel through which Eritreans living abroad send money to their relatives in Eritrea. So as far as the international tax uh, regime is concerned, like um, many countries, uh, the United States, for example, the uh, Eritrean government has, um, uh, on top of its various taxation laws, has this um, famous or infamous, depending on, on the context, famous or infamous 2% taxation system whereby all Eritreans, including, I believe, the Eritreans who are with me here, uh, Guido and Rahel and Elias and others, Barakat, uh, have an obligation to um, submit 2% of their tax to the Eritrean government. Now, the issue with this uh, system is, is the channel through which the uh, government collects these 2% from Eritreans uh, living abroad. Now, a lot of debate um, uh, has uh, been in, um, in discussion for a number of years regarding <coughs> The two percent tax. Uh, some, for instance, even go as far as stating that this is absolutely illegal. It's against international law, etc. But that argument has been phasing out lately. The recurrent uh, uh, attack against this system, however, is that the way the Eritrean government collects it uh, raises some uh, uh, some legal issues. For example, where this uh, two percent is collected or through which channels it goes to uh, the Eritrean treasury. So the story is long, but the, uh, the most visible channel through which the government transfers uh, accounts to the domestic banking system is through uh, some um, legitimately licensed uh, foreign exchange 
uh, entities, business licensing enti entities in Eritrea, which have uh, branches abroad, uh, such as the, the so-called Himbol uh, uh, currency um, agency. So uh, the United States, for example, Canada, Germany, uh, England, and the Netherlands, uh, just from top of my, my memory, they have uh, made a number of claims to uh, to hamper or block the collection of this tax uh, that comes to the Eritrean treasury. And uh, a number of stories can be uh, narrated as far as this collection system is concerned. Uh, the same with uh, the remittance system. Um, there was a time when the Eritrean government did not even uh, bother to make it public that the most significant source of revenue for the Eritrean economy was remittance that Eritreans sent to their families uh, to Eritrea. So because of the significance of these two channels of um, economy to the Eritrean economy, uh, a number of claims have been made, uh, but the most visible claim was the story that started to be narrated when uh, a UN-sponsored uh, or UN-established monitoring group uh, started to uh, narrate a number of stories regarding the process that the Eritrean government uh, uses to collect remittance uh, or to allow remittance to be collected or to collect the tax, uh, the two percent tax. So, uh, for example, there is a story whereby um, I guess uh, FBI agents or some local uh, law enforcement agencies came and um, I guess uh, stopped um, or I think even closed the office in, in Washington, D.C. that used to be the center, I mean, an open center where uh, the government used to collect um, the 2% tax. So they these two channels have been targeted for a number of years. And the economic consequences that followed are still being felt in and outside of Eritrea. In Eritrea, obviously, because now it is becoming very difficult, not only for the government to collect tax, but also for Eritreans to, to send money to, to Eritrea. Uh, as a result, um, and an economic analysis can be made, uh, but it's outside of this uh, discussion today, uh, the value that air trans used to send from abroad has now to, to double or triple. So someone who used to send um, $100 has now to send $200 or $300, which, which is difficult or even impossible for some air trans to support their families at this rate. So everybody's feeling the pain uh, of the, the difficulty or at times impossibility of using these, these two channels. Uh, uh, to this, we can add you know, the, the level of banking in Eritrea, which makes it um, a bit difficult to have a, a quick and effective way of uh, um, transferring, collecting, sending uh, currencies or, or money from abroad or even sending it from Eritrea. So the compound effect of all this is, is that uh, it is difficult uh, to uh, for, for an Eritrean living, I guess, in the US, in Britain, in the Netherlands, um, in most Western Europe to, to go to their local bank and ask that bank to transfer X amount of euro or X amount of dollars to um, a bank account in, in Eritrea. Um, I, I am also um, a witness to this. I was in, in Europe for a number of years, going to Europe, coming back to Eritrea. I had um, an account there. And when uh, the bank knew, uh, and I told them that I was on my way back to Eritrea, that I would be going back to reside in Eritrea, the bank asked me to terminate my my, my bank account there, and I and I said I want I want this bank account uh, for my you know international whatever whenever I need some international banking engagement, and they said, uh, sorry, we can't disclose a lot, but you have to uh, you're a lawyer, you can do the math, you're from Eritrea, we're here in Europe you have to uh, terminate. So I had to terminate that account and uh, and come back home. So, so not only those of us who are here in Eritrea, but those who are even living abroad are finding it very difficult to uh, make use of, of banking systems uh, that are available in uh, all over the world. So that is one uh, uh, example that is affecting not only the government or certain sections or personalities of the government, but affecting the, the entire Eritrean economy. 
Another example, a second example, uh, is the uh, issue with uh, the mining industry. This is one of these uh, examples of a, a one-off economic measure, but that uh, uh, might have had its own impact at that time, or it might have a, a similar impact in the near future. As you might know, uh, the most consistent and the most profitable um, FDI in Eritrea to date has been the burgeoning mining industry in Eritrea. We have uh, four uh, active mining industries at the mining companies at the moment. And the Eritrean government uh, has, in, in some cases, 40%, in others, 50% uh, of, of the share. So a joint venture is, is, is formed between uh, the government and a foreign investor. And we have four active mining companies now. We have uh, probably a dozen exploration companies and a few other companies which are engaged in prospecting. Now, the first company that went into uh, mining was uh, the Bisha Mining Share Company. So when uh, this company wanted to uh, borrow money to invest in uh, the mining in the Bisha mine, uh, a suitable um, uh, lending facility, a uh, lending bank was found in, in Germany. Uh, and I was personally involved in that line of transaction because the lawyers that represented that uh, company came to Asmara and uh, because I, I teach and I do some practice in, in the mining industry. So they asked for my legal advice. They did uh, due, due diligence about the Eritrean legal system, uh, about our court system, uh, about uh, the mining law, about taxation law, about investment law. So although it was not for the lawyers to decide uh, whether the, the company was going to lend money to the company, uh, I could sense from my years of experience working with uh, foreign lawyers that they they gave a, a positive recommendation for the bank to uh, go ahead and lend that money to Bisha Mining Share Company, but they didn't come back uh, as they promised. Uh, that means I I lost some uh, some lawyerly income that I could have uh, 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 I could have obtained from uh, from that transaction if it proceeded, but that is that is a personal income. But anyways, I heard later on that that bank agreed to uh, sign a contract with uh, uh, the company, the Bisha Mining Share Company, that uh, the Airtran Company signed the contract in London, and the German bank was about to um, sign uh, the contract in Berlin. Uh, and I know this story from uh, Dr. Saleh, uh, who was in Berlin at that time. Dr. Saleh, who gave his testimony yesterday, the Eritrean ambassador told them uh, that he was going to uh, a signing ceremony in Berlin for the German bank to go ahead and, and lend money to this Eritrean company. And then he came back a few hours later telling them that um, last minute some calls were made and the German bank uh, politely informed uh, uh, Bisha Mining Share Company that it could not proceed with the process uh, because they said, uh, we have some friends, we have some colleagues that we do not want to displease. So please understand the situation. And that's how uh, the thing collapsed. Uh, well, fortunately, or even obviously, because this is a very profitable uh, mining project, another lender, lender was found uh, some time down the road and Bisha now is, is, is in full operation. So the same situation might arise with um, the other mining companies that will need money to invest in their mining projects. Uh, I do not want to make uh, suggestions or even guess whether this is true or not. I also was involved in um, a similar um, adventure regarding one of the, the four mining companies. I was involved in the negotiations process and uh, some $200 million was made available, but I think the deal somehow collapsed. Uh, even But this one is worse after it was signed. So I, I don't know if, if it is the same story, but um, someone curious enough might uh, go about and do uh, some sort of research whether this thing also collapsed because of the same, the same pressure. So we have uh, the mining industry. Uh, why the mining industry? Because uh, when the 2009 UN Security Council uh, sanction was reviewed 
every year in one of the review processes, a recommendation was made to target the air time mining industry because it could be uh, a profitable source of income for the air time government to fund its activities that allegedly destabilized the Horn of Africa. Uh, thanks to uh, intense um, uh, efforts from the government and from some members of the Security Council, that uh, sanction did not go that far. But you can imagine that this uh, um, industry continues to be targeted. So this is uh, a second um, example of targeting um, um, a certain uh, wing of the uh, airline economy. Uh, just quickly through the third, uh, how many minutes? All right, I'll wrap up in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, the third example is the, the, the Hergigo uh, power plant. Uh, Three or four generators uh, are placed in this power plant. And this is the power plant that feeds probably um, the large majority of the air train, um, uh, the air train economy. And because these are generators uh, installed um, probably a quarter of a century ago, so there's a natural wear and tear, and they require repair and constant uh, upgrade. And for years, I, I, from what I can remember, I think from 2008, for the last 15 years, we have not had sufficient power supply in Eritrea, even in, ca in capital city. Even ministries uh, go for days without uh, a power supply. Now, the, the reason we always hear is that um, these generators um, are uh, European generators. The spare parts must uh, come from Europe if you want the original spare parts. And obviously, it is becoming very difficult to uh, uh, import these uh, uh, spare parts and uh, install them in these uh, generators. So uh, we find ourselves in a situation uh, that partly is the result of these um, economic sanctions. But there are other examples that I could, I could mention. I thought these are the, the big ones that um, uh, you can appreciate. But there is, for instance, the case of uh, ambulances that uh, uh, were well, the, the purchase of which was funded by UNICEF, but they couldn't be imported because ambulances can be used for um, for a dual purpose, uh, uh, mind you. Um, Airtran Airlines, uh, I think, arranged for the purchase um, of uh, some airplanes from Boeing or the purchase of spare parts from from Boeing, but uh, that deal also. Um, could not proceed because uh, Boeing slash uh, State Department, which uh, has an authority to uh, uh, sanction these uh, arrangements, um, did not uh, give its uh, its uh, its green light. Uh, the Ministry of Information also wanted to import some um, some materials, I, I guess from from Ireland, some uh, technical equipment for uh, for its use. These were also uh, not allowed to be exported to Eritrea uh, for probably the same reason. So we find a situation uh, whereby uh, either under excuse of uh, UN Security Council uh, or even after that, because uh, mind you, if someone might, might ask a question, well, the sanction was lifted in 2018, but if, if you read the, the way the sanction was imposed and lifted, its implementation is left to members of the Security Council and members of the UN, so they can impose it and, and lift it in, in ways that are compatible with their domestic political system and domestic laws. So even if that part has been uh, lifted, and, and mind you, even the, the sanction was not an economic sanction, but that has been interpreted very broadly to, to have an economic sank, an, an economic impact. So even now in 2023, five years after lifting of the sanctions, we find ourselves in a situation where directly or indirectly the Eritrean economy is being affected. Uh, so I guess in a nutshell, this is what I could say about that part of our testimony. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sanaya Andamariam. Uh, you're actually perfect on time, so I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for your uh, rich and excellent testimony. Our next, uh, our next witness is uh, Jan Furman. Uh, he is a renowned lawyer at the Bar of Brussels in, in Belgium. 
and Secretary General of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers, IADL. Um, he's also the, uh, which is, uh, IADL is the biggest international organization of progressive jurists. Uh, he's an experienced lawyer, legal advisor, researcher, teacher, and human rights defender. Um, and he specializes in, has specialized in criminal law, international humanitarian law, and human rights law. Um, Jan Furman has successfully defended many cases of trade unionists, political activists, and persecuted world revolutionaries. Um, with T. Sprocken, he published the book, uh, he published his book, Political Defense in 2010, um, uh, with Wolf Legal Publishers. And he has frequently visited Eritrea and supported the Eritrean Ministry of Justice in its training projects. Um, so, Mr. Furman, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, first of all, I would like to um, emphasize, as Dr. Sinai said um, at the start of his presentation, that um, the uh, sanctions on Eritrea are, first of all, uh, going on uh, for more than a decade and even more, that these sanctions have been of a various nature, um, were taken on various grounds, um, or better under various pretexts, uh, and also, are also a very various legal uh, uh, nature. Uh, first of all, there is what Dr. Senai spoke about actually is mainly informal sanctions. It's sanctions that, as far as I know, were not officially imposed nor by the UN mechanism, uh, nor by uh, uh, national countries as such, but it's sanctions that do not say their name. It's sanctions that are uh, informally imposed by all kinds of mechanisms, banks uh, that are uh, refusing to um, uh, provide credits under the influence of uh, the United States, mainly um, uh, companies that refuse to, to deliver goods uh, without any formal government decision. And so I think that is important to understand that <laughs> The sanctions, there is, I would say, the official part to it decided by the United States, the United Nations Security Council, or by, by national governments. But there is also a very broad spectrum of de facto sanctions, which are not officially decided by some uh, authority, but which are nevertheless very real and, and very much uh, imposed upon uh, Eritrea. And so it's a complex phenomenon. Uh, it's a complex phenomenon where both uh, private and, and public actors are uh, interfering. The formal public sanctions are uh, mainly taken under two different uh, regimes. One is uh, the sanctions uh, that were taken by the United States, the United Nations Security Council on the basis of Chapter 7 of the UN Charter in 2009 regarding alleged support of Eritrea to some of the armed groups in Somalia and non-compliance by Eritrea to decisions of the Security Council regarding an alleged border conflict with Djibouti. Those sanctions were, as you know, lifted in 2018 when a reconciliation occurred with the new Ethiopian government and a perspective of uh, regional peace uh, uh, came up. And then more recently, there are the unilateral coercive measures formally decided by the uh, United States and the EU, uh, which are sanctions in relation to the alleged Eritrean role in the war in Ethiopia uh, against the remnants of the former Ethiopian regime uh, constituted by the TPLF. There are differences in the legal state status of these two types of formal sanctions, and of course, also differences in legal status um, compared to the formal and the informal uh, de facto uh, sanctions. Uh, as far as the formal sanctions are um, uh, concerned, and I would like to concentrate on that uh, at this point, um, uh, the website of the United Nations Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur on the Negative Impact of Unilateral Coercive Measures defines these unilateral coercive measures as economic measures taken by one country to influence a policy change in another country. So it is all about uh, policy change. 
and the General Assembly on various occasions, the various General Assembly of the United Nations on various occasions, uh, uh, actually denounced that kind of unilateral coercive measures. Uh, finding, for example, in um, Resolution 52-120 of 12 December 1997, already at that time, that uh, urging states to refrain from adopting or implementing such unilateral measures, which are not in accordance with international law, and emphasizing that uh, such measures are uh, impeding a full realization of the rights set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other international human rights instruments, in particular, says the um, United Nations General Assembly, in particular, the rights of individuals and peoples to development, and further in the same text, reaffirming the principle of the right to self-determination. So the General Assembly very clearly took a position saying um, uh, such unilateral coercive measures are um, impeding on the right to um, development and in fact are um, incompatible with the right of self-determination. In other words, I think, uh, we have to consider such unilateral coercive measures as the ones that are now imposed upon Eritrea by the US and uh, the EU as violations of international law. That is not necessarily the case with uh, sanctions imposed by the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council does have under Chapter 7 uh, the authority to impose sanctions to keep uh, international peace. But in order to understand the question of sanctions against Eritrea and their lack of legality, I think we should look at the broader picture and the context uh, uh, of in which these sanctions, also the formal sanctions, have been adopted, uh, the context that has been described largely by, uh, I think, the witnesses you heard yesterday. The first matter of importance is, I think, to uh, see and to, to to emphasize that the sanctions are not necessarily what they appear to be. Uh, there is a whole hidden side also to these sanctions due to a very broad interpretation. Um, I visited Eritrea at the height of the uh, US-led campaign in the United Nations Human Rights Council against the country a few years ago. At that time, Eritrea was under a weapons embargo because the UN sanctions are essentially which was still uh, at that time in force, is a weapons embargo and an assets freezing uh, measures of certain, uh, certain members of the leadership uh, of Eritrea. Now, I witnessed personally during that um, uh, visit uh, that the combined slanderous campaign presenting both Eritrea as a threat to its neighbors which had led to the 2009 sanctions in the United Nations Security Council, and as a threat to its own citizens, which had led to the installation of a special commission of inquiry in the United Nations Human Rights Council, had negative consequences that went far beyond a weapons embargo and assets freezing of some of the country's leaders. I was particularly touched by uh, one visit I made to the uh, Faculty of Agro Agronomy the agricultural faculty near Asmara. Uh, there had been reports uh, in the months before I uh, visited Eritrea about the militarization of that faculty, the students being enrolled, being allegedly enrolled by force in the military, a forced displacement of the faculty outside Asmara to military barracks uh, in order to control better the students, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, what I saw was a simple but well-kept installations where students were indeed living in small prefab units, but for a ridiculous rent, which meant that they all, all they had free housing or almost free housing from the university. And above all, I saw very enthusiastic teachers, staff, and students who were dedicated to the development of its country, of the country and its agriculture. And when I spoke to the dean of the faculty, who was a very um, nice man, a, bot a botanist, who dedicated, dedicated his life to the study of aloe vera and was who was convinced that that plant offered many possibilities for economic development, uh, including pharmaceutical uh, developments, et cetera, in Eritrea. The man broke, at some point, broke, broke out in tears. 
And he explained to me that all exchanges with Western universities, all scientific exchanges with Western universities have been halted under the pressure of the UN sanctions and the allegations, the combined, that combined with the allegations about militarization of his faculty. And the Dean said very rightly that he didn't understand the attitude of the West and that he was devastated by the fact that the students would miss so many opportunities for scientific exchange with others in the world and therefore would by, by definition be less performant in their efforts to build up the country. I would say that was for me uh, a clear indication that there was a hidden face to the sanctions, that it was not only about uh, a weapons embargo, but that these sanctions touched, the sanctions combined with the demonization campaign touched upon very many aspects uh, of uh, uh, the life uh, of uh, Eritreans. And of course, the, UNS, the UN Security Council did not impose upon European universities to cut the ties with their counterparts in uh, Eritrea. But in practice, that is exactly what happened. And it is exactly that kind of side effect of sanctions that was also described by uh, Mr. Yamane Gebreyev, he was an advisor to the Eritrean president in a recent interview. In a recent interview, banks that cut relations and refuse to execute transfers related to businesses with Eritrea. We just heard an example of Dr. Sinai, uh, uh, who uh, was working as an academic in Europe, and then uh, the bank cut his uh, uh, closed his bank account when he went back to Eritrea under the pretext that uh, there could be no um, relations with Eritrea transporters refusing to take some goods from and to Eritrea, uh, being afraid of being uh, submitted to uh, criminal or uh, financial sanctions uh, by their own governments, um, transporters also being afraid of being submitted to costly inspections to see if the goods they transport do not contain any items under an arms embargo. So the effect of these sanctions is much, much broader than simply uh, uh, stopping arms from coming in or going out uh, of, um, of uh, Eritrea. So sanctions are not always what to, uh, they appear to be or what they say to be in the official decisions. And they spread like a cancer to various sectors of the country's life, to international exchanges, jeopardizing the basic rights to development of the Eritrean people, exactly like the UN Security Council, uh, the uh, UN General Assembly, uh, said previously would happen. Then the second point I would like to raise is that uh, Eritrea has been, beside from the sanctions, also been subject to a continuous process of demonization. And the sanctions are only a part of that process and should be analyzed in that context. Uh, <clears throat> as said previously, unilateral coercive measures are defined as measures taken by one country to influence a policy change in another country. And a similar method to achieve the same result, which always goes in hand in hand with sanctions and unilateral coercive measures, is demonization, of course. Demonization, like sanctions, is an attempt to isolate economically, politically, diplomatically a country to coerce it into policy change, or if that, not, is, that, if that is not possible, to provoke regime change, if necessary at some point, by brutal military force. Sanctions, unilateral coercive measures and demonization are therefore the necessary prerequisites to aggression as far as I'm concerned. The question of legality of the sanctions is therefore not only a matter of the mechanism that imposed the sanctions, UN Security Council or specific countries, national sanctions or UN sanctions. The substantive legality should also look into the valid validity of the grounds that are put forward to impose sanctions. And I again would like to illustrate that with uh, a personal experience. During my visit to Eritrea, which I mentioned previously, I met several of the UN representatives in that country, uh, including the UNDP representative, who was also the resident coordinator of the US agencies and the local representative of UNICEF. They both said that as far as they were concerned, the reality on the ground had strictly nothing to do with the terrible situation described in the reports of the UN. Human Rights Council Inquiry Commission. Uh, both those UN representatives on the ground lauded the efforts 
of the Eritrean authorities to assure the basic rights of Eritreans to development, education, security, etc. And both told me how the sanctions and their indirect consequences harmed those efforts. UN people working every day in Eritrea who knew the situation on the ground underscored how the policy of self-reliance of the Eritrean authorities, their efforts to build a stable country led to the results that were 180 degrees the opposite of what was described in the inquiry commission reports presented in Geneva. Inquiry commission that was, uh, by the way, of course, uh, established on the instigation of the uh, United States uh, and of Western countries. A few months later, that, uh, it, that led even to a more surrealistic situation that while in the main meeting room of the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, horrendous things were read out by the rapporteur of the Inquiry Commission, the coordinator of the UN agencies in Eritrea, or one these lady, participated in a forum on the tremendous, in the same building on the tremendous successes of the Eritrean authorities in eradicating female genital, genital mutilation in the country. Same day in the same place, people on the ground uh, uh, said positive things about Eritrea. The same day, the same place, the people of the Inquiry Commission who had never been in Eritrea and only talked to some uh, refugees and some opponents uh, uh, to the government um, uh, were saying exactly the opposite. When I asked, by the way, these local UN representative, if the Commission of Inquiry had ever made any effort to contact them and to hear from their, from their experience on the ground, the answer was negative. There was never any attempt in that sense. So it became clear to me through this that the process of sanctions, unilateral coercive measures, and demoniz demonization are completely intertwined and inseparable. And previous witnesses have explained how the policy of self-reliance uh, of Eritrea, rejecting imperialist control over the economy by breaking away from the World Bank and the IMF, the policy of regional cooperation and regional friendship and opposition to foreign interference in the internal affairs of the countries of the Horn of Africa uh, conducted by Eritrea had provoked the anger of US imperialism. And the react US reacted to that by measures to influence a policy change in Eritrea, because that is what is exactly about uh, sa what sanctions and UCMs, unilateral coercive measures, are about. Um, I think it became clear to me that the real purpose of these sanctions and the unilateral coercive measures and all forms of harassment and pressure, informal sanctions that are imposed um, on uh, Eritrea are indeed provoked by uh, U.S. instigation, were done on U.S. instigation, uh, and that the obvious aim of this concerted campaign of sanctions, uh, unilateral coercive measures, and demonization is a blunt, blunt attempt to deny the Erit Eritrean people, and by extension all the people of the Horn of Africa, the right to self-determination that is enshrined in the Common Article 1 of the two UN covenants on civil, political, economical, social, and cultural rights of 1966. And it is my conclusion from a careful study of the facts that the sanctions imposed in 2009 upon Eritrea by the UN Security Council and resulting from US manipulation, as well as the, the unilateral coercive measures imposed by the US and the EU resulting from the recent war in Ethiopia, as well as the demonization campaign as are to be seen as one single combined effort uh, to violate the right to self, to deny the right to self-determination and the right to development uh, of the um, uh, Eritrean people and have therefore to be, have therefore, therefore to be seen as a violation of the principle of non-interference and sovereign equality of nations enshrined in Article 2 of the UN Charter. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Furman. That was also an excellent presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, our next witness is uh, Professor Rahel Sabatu, who is a post-colonial feminist political scientist specializing in international relations. Um, she is currently pursuing her PhD in global politics at Malmo University in Sweden. Uh, Professor Sabatu is a proud member of Eritrea's 13th round of national service has held leadership positions 
uh, including as a member of the Central Council of the National Union of Eritrean Youth and Students, the NUEYS. And she was one of the uh, vice presidents of the Pan-African youth, uh, youth Movement from 2011 to 2014. Uh, she is currently a board member of the European Network Against Racism and the, re uh, and the research lead for Afrozist. Um, Professor Sabatu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'm not a professor, I'm a PhD candidate, just so that's clear. Um, but my, my apologies. My yeah, apologies. I'll be able to, to hold that title. Uh, that's the, um, again, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, the delegitimization de of uh, not just the Eritrean government, but things related to Eritrean history and national identity have been used in an attempt to uh, divide the Eritrean people from its government. Uh, the lie that we have been told for years is that sanctions against Eritrea are only there to target the Eritrean uh, government or officials. However, the ramifications of the unjust sanctions uh, against the state of Eritrea has had it has impacted the population in profound ways. I will talk about how sanctions and other for foreign policy decisions made by the United States and uh, the European Union as an entity that seems to mimic uh, US foreign policy, how they have targeted and negatively affected the lives of Eritrean youth and women. We have already heard uh, testimonies that describe, that have attempted to describe the pretext of why Eritrea has been sanctioned, or if I, be frank, if I can be frank, the excuses posed to uh, legitimize the reasons around uh, why these sanctions have uh, been imposed. Um, my previous colleagues have already made it clear that these unjust sanctions have gone beyond what has been written on paper. Uh, the grand majority of sanctions against Eritrea are in fact informal and are imposed with the idea that one, uh, the Eritrean project as a, you know, to become a uh, self-reliant nation, nation cannot uh, survive. Uh, you know, the threat of a good example, uh, because if Eritrea becomes self-reliant, uh, then other African nations could feel inspired by that and pursue similar policies. And then there's also the uh, other reason, and that is to cause misery uh, with the idea that by causing uh, the population to, or by putting them in a miserable state, that they will rise up against the Eritrean government. We have been told that the state of Eritrea has been a spoiler in the, in the region, uh, the region meaning the Horn of Africa in particular, and yet Eritrea is and continues to be one of the safest countries in the region. As other countries uh, in the Horn of Africa are uh, really suffering from internal disorder and conflict, Eritrea rests on the Honor of Africa almost as an island of peace. Um, and this is due to the national identity uh, uh, and co collective way of living and believing in their country that uh, the Eritrean people uh, are able to live in such harmonious ways, something that really materialized during the Eritrean liberation struggle and something that has been sustained, especially through the national development, uh, uh, sorry, National Service Program. The National Service Program is for all able-bodied uh, Eritrean citizens to go through. Uh, this includes women. Uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I, I myself uh, am a proud member of the 13th round, which uh, was, uh, was where, when the military uh, training started, it was during the year 2000. In fact, just right after a, uh, a ceasefire during the third offensive of the border conflict that was going on at the time between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Um, and since then, uh, there has been this continuous uh, both demonization and victimization uh, narrative purported uh, by uh, imperialist countries, including the United States, that uh, use this national service uh, program and its prolongation as an excuse to, uh, to, to conduct these sa sa sanctions, but also uh, 
it's used in a way that uh, punishes Eritrea for daring to seek a policy of self-reliance. Prior to the uh, border conflict between, so the national service program started in 1994, uh, and it was uh, it was was started as or in in in, in kind of legacy of uh, the the liberation struggle uh, uh, for Eritrea's independence, and uh, it was set that it would be a total of 18 months six months of military training and in a year of national service that could be conducted within the military or uh, in, in, in like a ministry or as a teacher. Uh, and prior to this uh, conflict, uh, the, the border conflict, it was 18 months. So people were able to, you know, quote unquote, go back home, uh, you know, uh, after it was done, like they, they, had, they would complete their national uh, service and then were able to continue on with their lives. But because of the border conflict and how it has been, pro, uh, how it was protracted into this no war, no, no peace situation, um, it, a lot of young people um, have had to do the, uh, the, act, the activities similar to national service uh, longer than they, uh, longer than planned to say the least, because of the continuous threats uh, coming from Ethiopia, particularly Ethiopia under the uh, TPLF regime. Uh, you know, we, a lot of young people had to spend um, a lot of time at the borders protecting, uh, you know, uh, the, the country uh, for any threat. There were many times where the uh, Ethiopia under the TPLF regime had made attempts to uh, invade Eritrea even after the Algiers peace agreement, which was signed in uh, uh, December 2000. Uh, and so the real threat for national security has always been there, has always been there. And the United States and Europe have always known this, uh, especially because the TPLF uh, had, uh, did not hold back uh, when they, you know, in, in advertising or, you know, promoting the fact that they had, uh, you know, uh, sought to invade Eritrea or that there was an attack at the border, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, what you won't hear about Eritrea's national service uh, in, in these demonization uh, attempts is that the reason why it has been prolonged for anybody is because of the very real security threat that existed. Uh, the 2000 uh, Algiers Peace Agreement was not just signed between Eritrea and Ethiopia, but there were also guarantors to this agreement. Um, can you just give me one sec? I will share the screen real quick so that you can see what I am talking about. Hmm. Uh, this is just a screenshot of, uh, you know, how it was signed. We had the United Nations, we had the Organization of African Unity and the European Union, uh, as well as the uh, United States, uh, the Secretary of State at the time, uh, were witnesses and guarantors of this peace agreement. And yet there were many attempts uh, after, um, the, uh, uh, after the final and binding decision was made to either reverse the, the decision or, uh, and sorry, I shouldn't say, either, but it was to either, it was their it was attempts for them to reverse the decision, but also to create a, a, a chaotic uh, situation where the state of Eritrea would somehow implode internally because of the, the strife that it created. When it came to the sanctions imposed on Eritrea uh, for uh, the accusations of uh, supporting uh, Somalia's Al-Shabaab uh, movement, even with the uh, monitoring group, the monitoring groups uh, updated reports, uh, regular reports on the situation. Uh, I mean, anybody can go ahead and read them. You will not see like there's they don't present actual evidence that Eritrea is supporting um, uh, Al Shabaab. Interestingly enough, uh, these uh, illegal uh, and unjust sanctions. Uh, at least the ones that uh, were made under the pretext of supporting Al-Shabaab and the concocted uh, border disagreement with uh, uh, Djibouti. It was in 
2018 that the uh, the first attempt to uh, or I should probably say the attempt that made the, those particular sanctions become uplifted took place. And that, that was the day after um, uh, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed, had visited Eritrea. And uh, the, the day after he met with the uh, UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, and he presented him with a letter um, this very, uh, the, the, I think this is very, uh, it's very interesting to, to contemplate that if, er, if for so many years, uh, er, the state of Eritrea will be sanctioned, knowing that this would affect uh, the, the, er, the local population of Eritrea, including youth and women, that a simple process of presenting a letter asking for these sanctions to be uplifted would would work. It did not have to do with any preconditions of uh, you know supporting al-Shabaab because actually there was no evidence about it. It didn't have to do with anything with, with Djibouti. Um, so that should also let us um, give us a very good idea of how these sanctions came about. Already uh, colleagues have described that, um, especially uh, Dr. Simon Tasmarem, he said it uh, yesterday. I won't get into too much details about that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's 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 very uh, interesting to say the least. Um, through this demonization and yet victimization, uh, a couple of things I want to highlight, especially in regards to the young people uh, and the women that that, that partook in this uh, in military and national service, is that uh, Eritrean women make a significant uh, uh, or significant part of the program. Uh, like I said, all able-bodied uh, persons from the age 18 are uh, obliged to do military and national service. I cannot tell you the exact percent of how many women do it uh, because I honestly, I don't know, uh, but it is a reflection of the legacy of our foremothers who did uh, take part in the Eritrean liberation struggle. And I know it was uh, more than 30% of women that participated in the liberation uh, struggle. This liberation struggle has, uh, you, you know, um, uh, created uh, a lot of the, um, the, the, the situation where young people, especially young women today are able to uh, exercise their rights, their rights to participate. Uh, uh, in all affairs of the uh, the country, and I must say that I am also very proud of this legacy uh, and what it means in terms of uh, women's rights in Eritrea today. Um, but instead of uh, recognizing this as a a way of empowering young women, uh, young Eritrean women, it is used to spell uh, spread false propaganda that. Uh, you know, the Sawa training camp is a uh, place of sexual exploitation, um, you know, instead of, you know, recognizing women's agency uh, in not only defending themselves and their country, but also, you know, taking part in these, these processes that are, you know, that really um, consolidate any type of feeling of, uh, of citizenship, right? Through this, this act of participation, they reduce their, their agency to only try to uh, portray them as victims. Again, all none of these accusations are, um, you know, really justified with any evidence. Again, I've been there myself, and I can tell you that it has. It's not a place of systemic sexual harassment, or, or what you know you be what has been told to us in in uh, through so many different uh, propaganda channels. So I have to go to, back to my notes. Uh, Another thing is that uh, you know they, the national service program uh, is uh, this. What, what's not told, uh, you know, most of the time is that it's not just through the uh, the military or through the army or any of those type of capacities that young people partake in this. They do uh, a lot of very important work 
uh, in ministries, as teachers, in national health campaigns, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of times, especially, uh, you know, uh, in the in, in the nineties, this theory of youth bulge uh, across the African continent, this idea of uh, young people being idle because they cannot find jobs emerge on the uh, global political scene. Uh, and it was used to, you know, uh, promote like some type of threats that would come because these young people are, are idle, that they will be disgruntled and maybe they would call, cause different uprisings across, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the continent. Uh, this, the National Service Program also works as a way for people to uh, almost, it's almost like doing an internship, uh, you know, where you are given the opportunity to, uh, you know, do work in relation to your, your field or your experience, uh, and then contribute through uh, development of the country through that, right? So um, uh, I'm thinking of an example, like if, if somebody uh, has gone through nursing school or, you know, uh, through the Orata uh, Medical School, then they will, you know, will do national service related to in the, in the health field or, um, uh, I myself, I, because I was involved with uh, youth and student rights, I had been active in the National Union of Eritrean Youth and Students. After, um, uh, uh, because I was involved, I was able to do my national service there. And then when it came to demobilization, I continued to work there. So it, it, it does work at, it does have this kind of like job placement, um, uh, aspect of it. Um, I think I still have a bit of time. Uh, I want to emphasize something of how, uh, at least from what we've witnessed over the years, what this really does, what is the function of this, the demoralization and dehumanization of the type of very valuable contributions that young people uh, do uh, for their country. Uh, mind you, this is all in a legacy. This is all uh, a legacy of our long uh, liberation struggle. It is part of our history. Um, we are, we, we, and because Eritrea is a young nation, a developing country, it's important that we contribute to this development. However, this narrative has been spread that young people uh, uh, are, are, are basically slaves. They, the, the National Service Program is a program of slavery, uh, which is in no way uh, true. I mean, we're, you, don't, uh, you don't become rich doing national service. I mean, but there, of course it is, is, it is paid. Um, uh, and so, yeah, in, or, in a way to demoralize the young people uh, and de dehumanize their contribution, this narrative has been proposed. And this has also been uh, a common excuse used to uh, put uh, Eritrea through these this, uh, informal uh, sanctions. Uh, and so besides uh, this kind of demoralization or dehumanization of the contribution of young people in the development of their country uh, by telling them that they are uh, slaves and also by giving, you know, providing incentive for them to uh, migrate outside the country, um, to, in fact, to, to be trafficked outside the country um, has had devastating uh, effects. The sanctions have always uh, had this aim of creating misery, um, you know, uh, uh, hindering development. Uh, Dr. Sen, I already mentioned, just, you know, in terms of like energy, for instance, the ability to, uh, you know, have uh, regular uh, electrical, like uh, access to electricity has uh, been a result of, of, of sanctions and the inability to get like spare parts. Uh, by causing uh, misery towards a population, and by also creating incentives for uh, brain drain, um, 
and we also know this, I should mention, through uh, like the WikiLeaks, for example, that it's been US policy to allow, in fact, to, 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 yeah, to make it very easy for uh, young people, especially young professionals, to uh, go to the United States. And we also know by uh, lived experience of, you know, and, and other testimonies that we've heard that despite having, you know, the professional background or this education, once they reach there, they are relegated to jobs that are uh, not related to their uh, work experience, education or profession. They, uh, I mean, they, are, they basically are forced to do uh, some, you know, menial work like uh, the, the janitors or, you know, the taxi drivers and so on and so forth. Um, and this has had very devastating effects, uh, especially for the, uh, um, it's had a very psychological impact on many young people uh, throughout the, you know, North America and Europe, uh, where we see the rate of, of um, uh, suicide, for instance, being, it, it's been a very big issue in, uh, in the diaspora communities. We also have seen through things like WikiLeaks that, um, uh, you know, that there's been a special target on trying to get young Eritrean people like uh, professionals to organize them so that they would work against uh, their, uh, the Eritrean government, uh, that what they would promote these things, again, national services, slavery, uh, what, what have you. Um, and so we know that, uh, you know, because the young people are such a, uh, a huge asset for, for, for Eritrea's future, pres pres Eritrea's presence, present time and future, um, that they've also been the, 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 the target of these informal sanctions and other activities used to uh, try to, um, uh, you know, uh, create this internal stability to punish Eritrea for its uh, self-reliance, its policy on self-reliance. Uh, interesting enough, um, through all this uh, demonization of, of, um, of Air, uh, the Eritrean National Service, uh, when uh, there was talks of uh, the, the, the Suzanne Rice, uh, the, uh, when there was uh, when there was talks that she was going to become the domestic advisor of the, for the United States, uh, she had an interview where she had uh, this to say about national uh, service. I'm going to briefly let you hear that and then close. Uh, Please let me know if you can hear it. If you can't, uh, let me press play. Uh, I don't think we can hear it. I cannot hear it on my end. Okay. Yeah, let me um, fix that. Share sound. Okay, one more time. Yeah, We've but not all the time. And then we've got to do some stuff, I think, at a national level, like mandatory national service for all Americans 18 to 22. Think about it. If for 6 to 12 months, if for 6 to 12 months Get we all had to phone. work together and we, we had to understand each other from, you know, some rural kid from Idaho having to work with some kid from the South Bronx. Right. That would, it's hard to hate people when you actually know them. All right, last question. Yeah, uh, I'm really laughing inside. I laugh every time I find every time I hear it. How she uh, has been very instrumental uh, in uh, not only just demonizing uh, Eritrea, but also um, really trying to promote uh, instability throughout the Horn of Africa. Um, and you know, for her to then basically describe Eritrea's uh, national service and how it should be implemented in the United States, um, just 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 goes to show the hypocrisy uh, and um, really the the, the damage uh, that these narratives, these these very negative narratives, that target young people, uh, and also then has them. Uh, feel uh, very uh, demoralized and de dehumanized through these narration processes. Uh, yeah, that um, that this would be the case that we 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 witness. You know, that case the situation that we live in. Um, 
yeah, I believe my time is up. Uh, so thank you for hearing me. I would uh, answer any questions uh, that might come up later on. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rahel. Uh, excellent presentation as well. Uh, our next presenter, our next witness is Martin Zimmerman. Uh, Martin Zimmerman is a journalist and author who's written numerous articles and evaluation reports about Eritrea in various German and Swiss media. He's the author of the book, Eritrea, March Towards Freedom, which was published in Germany in 1990, and the second ed edition came out in 1992. Um, Martin Zimmerman's solidarity with Eritrea through the Eritrean Relief Association in Germany, or the EHT, dates back to the early 1980s. Uh, Martin visited Eritrea during the struggle for independence in 1985, uh, again in 87 and in 88 as well. He frequently visits Eritrea since its liberation in 1991, and he was the chair of the EHD from 1991 to 2018. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you. You hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. As a witness, uh, our sanctions are hindering Eritrea's development. Even if those who impose the sanctions keep always denying it, sanctions hit the poorest and the most vulnerable groups of people and violate universal human rights. Since I have been involved with Eritrea a long time, I have experienced that the people of this country are being wronged. At decolonization in 1952, Eritrea as a former colony from Italy was not released to independence, but forced into a federation with Ethiopia at the instigation of the United States of America. In 1962, Eritrea was annexed by Ethiopia. The international community silently accepted this annexation in violation of international law. For 30 years, Eritrea fought for his independence in Africa's longest liberation struggle. In 91, 1991, this ended with Ethiopia's military defeat and in Eritrea's de facto independence. In 1993, three, 30 years ago, the Eritrean people voted overwhelmingly for independence and for the formation of the state of Eritrea in an internationally supervised referendum. In a few days on 24th of May, Eritrea will celebrate 32 years of independence. However, this Independence Day, the upcoming Independence Day celebrations, do not make us uh, forget that during this 32 years of independence, the country was subjected to 10 years of unjustified UN sanctions, was mentioned before. These were based on the false accusations of supporting the Somali terrorist mil militia Al-Shabaab. Subsequently, the country has also been subjected to unilateral sanctions by the United States of America, which severely hamper the country's development. I think it was very impressive uh, how Dr. Senai, some minutes before, presented uh, this case. However, these uh, 32 years of independence are also a reminder for me, for Eritrea's steadfastness and resistance to any outside, outside interference, up to and including the well-known regime change plan of the United States administration, for which Eritrea is a thorn in the flesh. Let, li let me briefly outline why Eritrea is a thorn in the flesh of the United States and Western nations, and is therefore being covered with sanctions. It is important to know this background for the presentation of our case. During the 30 years of liberation struggle, the APLF, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, not only fought for national independence, but also for a social transformation of the society, for equal rights for women, for self-determination, self-administration, and thus the participation of the population in social progress. And no time did the EPLF follow any other political model. 
it has not allowed itself to be instrumentalized by foreign forces. It has always gone its own way. In this struggle, the political foundation for the future of the independent Eritrea were laid. I visited the liberated areas of Eritrea several times. I have seen the development of these politics with my own eyes, reported about it and described it with numerous secret documents in my book, Eritrea on the Road to Freedom. And this struggle, Tanzania's former Minister of Economy, Abdul Rahman Babu, he called it in 1985, a new revolution that will create new hopes for Africa. And this struggle was also supported from numerous solidarity groups all over the world. I mentioned as an example here, the Swiss Support Committee for Eritrea, SUKE, or the German Eritrea Hilfswerk, EHD, which as a part of the International Eritrean Relief Association, helped people in Eritrea to help themselves. Both organizations for which I'm speaking here today were committed not only to humanitarian aid for Eritrea, but also to political solidarity with Eritrea's liberation struggle. Why? Because we believed then, as we do now, that it is the fundamental right of people in the country to determine its own path into the future without any outside interference. Political autonomy and self-sufficiency are the cornerstone of a country's independence. After its hard-won independence, Eritrea has constantly expanded and pursued this policy of independent political and economic development, independent from the World Bank or the AIMF. Eritrea has refused to let the states or other countries impose their economic or political will on it. Critics of Eritrea often refer to, to Eritrea's policy of self-reliance as a kind of isolationism. This is sheer nonsense. Such accusations spring on the desperation of those actors who would like to control and exploit Eritrea's strategic location on the Red Sea and the exploitation of its vast resources, gold, potash, etc. It is also not correct to claim that Eritrea rejects any outside help. It is correct, however, that Eritrea cooperates with investors and also with NGOs, if this cooperation takes place on an equal partnership. Examples of this is uh, in the mining sectors, was mentioned before also, is the cooperation between the Eritrea National Mining Company and Nafsen Canada and the Bisha Mine, also other players, each with 40 or 50 percent uh, stake. It's precisely in this area that Eritrea could have development developed further if there were not the sanctions. I remember that I once spoke with a German businessman I met in Asmara. He and his company would have liked to start producing leather goods. He was very enthusiastic about the peaceful country and the well-educated people. But like many investors, after some time, he ultimately avoided the country because he was not sure. There was the negative press, there was the existing sanction. And so he was, uh, he decided uh, to avoid and to not in, uh, uh, invest in Eritrea. To cut a long story short, Eritrea refuses to sell off its resources for a pittance and wants to use these resources to build up its own economy so that the country is not condemned to hang on the trip of international aid. This, of course, is not a framework for how imperialist countries envisage the exploitation of raw materials. This policy is a thorn in the flesh of the imperialism. Let me say some words about the role of NGOs. As it's well known, Eritrea works closely with the UN, UN organizations, 
such as uh, UNDP, UNICEF, and others. Not, however, with large internationally operating NGOs whose program often pursue their own policies outside state structures and do not help to lead the country out of the dependency. On the contrary, their aid even cements dependencies. Eritrea's president Isaias Afewerki corrected stately some time ago, aid is like a pill that numbs the pain. If you take it too often, you get addicted. In this political environment, EHG and Suke have been supporting the reconstruction of the country as a solidarity group since independence. Our principle here is equal partnership and even more, our Eritrean project partners own the projects and they set the decisive impulses in planning and implementation of the project. This is a central principle of our work. Only in this way can development cooperation be successful and not lead to new dependencies. I think that experience also teaches us when we examine and evaluate development cooperation of the past decades. As relatively small organizations, we have focused our post-independence development assistance to the underdevelopment areas in Eritrea. To name a few examples, EHD and Suke have built, equipped a clinic school a veterinary station in Shabuko in uh, the Western Lowland. We have supported dam constructions and water supply in close cooperation with the population and the uh, 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 village uh, organizations in Deposina and Simomo, Shepsheleba and Bego and surrounding and arid, uh, areas. Together we have supported integrated village development projects, mm -hmm. in, for example in Perak, dam construction, water supply construction of kindergarten, support of the elementary school. This list con could be continued. In the medical field, we have built and equipped dental clinics. We were active for more than 10 years in the field of training anesthesia and intensive care medicine at the Asmara College of Health Science. Then in the field of education and training ultrasound diagnostic with the supply of equipment and almost more importantly, importantly with the transfer of knowledge, the transfer of know-how from German specialists to their Eritrean colleagues. Suke has been supporting a very important project in Masawa for several years. The Masawa Worker and Vocational Training Center, which is run by the Eritrean Trade Union Federation, NCEW. Here, young people from industry and service companies are trained and educated at a high level. Swiss experts pass on their know-how to the Eritrean teachers. How have we experienced sanctions and their effects on our, let's say, low-paced or grassroots uh, uh, work? Also, medical support was never officially part of sanctions. We have only been able to deliver anesthesia or respiratory equipment with the greatest difficulties and long delays. <laughs> Lufthansa, for example, refused to transport respira respiratory equipment to Eritrea because of the sanctions was recently given to us, which lacked uh, any basis and long discussions were necessary with Lufthansa until we, we were able to send uh, these machines and to, to, to continue our uh, projects. As it is well known and mentioned uh, some sometimes before also, the energy supply sector, sector was hit hard by sanctions. Power cuts have had devastating effects on staff and especially patients in the medical uh, sector. The failure of a ventilator in an intensive care unit is a death sentence for the patient. If the medical staff do not manage to keep the patient alive with manual ventilation and treatment. And this has happened several times when I stood in Asmara 
Sanctions kill, and sanctions are a weapon directed against the weakest in the society. Let me briefly describe the importance of our income generating projects. Just a second. We support poor families by distributing goats for the establishment of a goat farm. We support war disabled people by training them as beekeepers and financing the necessary equipment. We support women living with HEV through our path partner Bidho. They are enabled to earn a living by training as weavers. We distribute donkeys to poor, mostly single women in cooperation with NCEW, the trade union. With the help of this four-ledged helper, the lives of these women improve significantly. Two of these women described to me what this support means to them. For example, there is Wudase Tinse. She is one of the weavers who was trained in a project with Bideho in 2019. Today, she is economically, economically independent and sells woven traditional clothing. She also earns income from embroidery, the colorful embroidered bed sheets, tablecloths, dresses, she makes are in a great demand and she sell well at the market, she reports. What of her skill has spread in the town where she lives? With her income, the 43 year old can feed her family with three children well, she, she, she told me. And she found her place in the society. Or Verkit Seregabir, she is a 45 years old and a mother of four. She led a contented life in Tecombia with her husband until he died and she found herself without an income from one day to the next. She received a donkey from the Suke program eight years ago and has since become a successful and respected trader at the Tuesday market in Tecombia. She started with a small stall at the market. The donkey helped to transport the goods, she say. In the beginning, it was very hard, but I was quickly known at the market. I always tried to offer a wide range of goods, goods like noodles, torches, batteries, soap, powder, many uh, more other things that other traders in the market did not have to offer. This business idea worked, and a good two years ago, Verkit was able to expand. The donkey was no longer sufficient to transport the quantity of her goods. She bought a donkey cart from her savings. Today, she uses it to transport goods to the weekly market. On other days, the donkey cart serves as a taxi for a small fee. She takes people to health facilities or to other places with the donkey cart. All in all, she told me, with satisfaction, the donkey project has changed the life of me and my children for the better. And not only financially, although I am a widow, I am now a respected woman. These ex examples make clear there are projects that achieve great things on a very small scale. They lay the foundation for people to live a life in dignity. And what is if even more important, they are enabled to participate in society and to emancipate themselves. Preventing such a development, this is in my opinion, precisely the intended effect of sanctions. But we as a small uh, uh, associations, we are uh, faced with all these uh, difficulties uh, like uh, bank transfers and so on and the first experience we have had uh, with that was in uh, the early summer 2021 when a bank refused to transfer some small funds to i think it was to to Bideho for for a goat project in a time where there were neither un sanctions nor 
unilateral sanctions imposed on Eritrea. So it, from, we start to go in a discussion with the company, but we can't go, uh, can't find a, a solution. So I went to Dirk Vogelsang, he, he is a lawyer, and he will describe you now our experience we made in this case with German financial institutions. So I would like to hand over to Dirk to continue. Thank you so much, Mr. Zimmerman. Uh, excellent, again, another excellent uh, uh, hearing uh, presentation, I should say. Um, I will transfer to uh, Dirk Vogelsong right now. Let me uh, give, provide his bio for our audience and then Dirk, I'll let you take it away. Uh, Dirk Vogelsong was a lawyer by profession and founder and senior partner of a law firm from 1989 to 2020 that mainly engaged in representing sector unions, including pilots, air traffic controllers, cabin staff, and technicians. His friendship and solidarity with Eritrea goes back to the 1970s, supporting the EPLF, uh, EPLF uh, diaspora organizations in Germany. In 1982, he worked in the German branch of the Eritrea Relief Association, EHD. And from 1990 to 2003, he was board member of the of, uh, German Eritrea and Friendship Society, DEFG, uh, along with uh, in the headquarters of Hamburg, uh, which mainly engaged in publicity work for Eritrea. And since 2017, he's been the chair of the German uh, Eritrea Society. Um, again, headquarters in Frankfurt, whose main purpose is deepening relations uh, between Germans and Eritreans, dismantling distortions, showing a, real, a realistic image of Eritrea uh, as well. Dirk is a frequent visitor of Eritrea since liberation with close connections with the National Confederation of Eritrean Workers and uh, Eritrean media with numerous articles, interviews, events, presentations, among other things, and building up uh, support networks with, and lobby activities. So uh, Dirk, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Navid, for the introduction. Uh, and I want to uh, thank particularly uh, Jan Furman for his uh, deep insight in the mechanisms and true nature of sanctions on a large scale. I will do this on a much smaller scale, but uh, this is a suitable base for, for what uh, Martin and I wanted to present. Uh, okay, clock is ticking. I'll start right away. Uh, as Martin and I discussed in preparation how best to present the different sides of our case, one significant fact became increasingly clear to us. Sanctions have always the same devastating effect on those affected, but never in the same way related to the particular conditions of the country and its population against which they are imposed. For this reason, we wanted to clarify what the situation in Eritrea and its people was like at the time when the sanction regime was put into effect. And as we all know, it's still today. So our reports, which are in fact two flip sides of the same coin, are therefore guided by the following questions. What is the impact of sanctions in a country like Eritrea, whose population, against the backdrop of a decades-long struggle, under the most difficult conditions, maintains its independence, self-sufficiency, and freedom from any external domination? And secondly, how are sanctions implemented and enforced from the imposition to their implementation to their justification? And what happens when those charged with enforcing them encounter unexpected resistance? And Martin has answered the first question. The second question, Imposing sanctions, how does that work? And I could add sometimes uh, also fail. I would like to illustrate with the help of a small example, which Martin already mentioned two years ago. I will come back to this later. However, with regard to the context of such measures and their purpose, it seems necessary for us to define the special quality of sanctions. Boycott measures are ultimately always a means of forcing compliance, establishing dominance and subjugating a country stigmatized as hostile or intransigent, as well as its population. I will go now a long way back, timely, uh, to, uh, to cite uh, 
the uh, president, the, the 28th president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, who soberly stated in 1919, more than 100 years ago, I didn't know this before, and thus at a time when people were, were less concerned about political masquerade, I quote, a nation boycotted is a nation that is in sight of surrender. Apply this economic, peaceful, silent, deadly remedy, and there will be no need for force. It is a terrible remedy. It does not cost a life outside the nation boycotted, but it brings pressure upon the nation that, in my judgment, no modern nation could resist. End of quotation. In view of this unreserved and brutal statement, one cannot help but wonder, how can measures ever be justified that, in the estimation of one of their inventors, have such devastating effects? From what should they draw their legal and legitimizing justification? The cynical counter question of those who impose sanctions and therefore actually should provide answers could be, why justification? We just do it because we can. And because it should be added, the ground for this has been long since prepared elsewhere by making a country a country sanctionable through a lengthy run-up of exclusion, isolation, demonization and stigmatization as a pariah state, a rogue state, or in Donald Trump's diction, a shithole state. There is hardly any other country where this can be observed as excessively as in the case of Eritrea, which is, as you all know, often referred to as the North Korea of Africa and the Western media. The German Eritrean society of which I'm a member is engaged in exposing this narrative, breaking through it and thus depriving it of its legitimating basis. The narrative is whatever coercive measures we the West apply, all those who are affected by them deserve it anyway. Sort of like the usual suspect in an American crime movie. This holds true even when the specific reason for imposing sanctions has long since been disproved. As was the case, you mentioned this, when sanctions were imposed on Eritrea in 2009 for alleged support of the Somali al-Shabaab group, which remained in force even after several independent commissions of inquiry could find no evidence that the allegations were true. Or as a UN staff member in Asmara once remarked to me, evidence? Who needs evidence? Human rights violations always work. During the same stay in Eritrea in 2016, I attended the International Trade Union Congress of the National Confederation of Eritrean Workers, NCW, as a representative of German sectoral trade unions. At the beginning of the Congress, some officials who had traveled from African or European capital cities, like Brussels, tried with considerable effort to turn the whole event into an Eritrea bashing. The whole action was obviously planned and coordinated, and the accusations were forced labor under the National Service, greetings to Rahel, brainwashing of Eritrean youth in the Central Educational Institution Sawa, Rahel again, human rights violations. After three days, which included a visit to the Eritrean mine in Bisha and many discussions, the mood was completely tilted in favor of Eritrea with a large majority of the delegates, a final resolution was passed that called for the lifting of all sanctions. Ergo, the sanctions regime does not care about the correctness of justification, not even when they have already been refuted. But there is another effect which applies to all sorts of sanctions. Just as the claim by the military of surgical precise airstrikes is a lie, the effects of sanctions cannot be limited or contained. On the contrary, here too, the collateral damage is pre-programmed and, del and deliberate. Not only does it affect everyone, but as Martin said, if it affects in particular the weakest and most vulnerable groups, which means in the last consequence that sanctions can have the same devastating effect as military aggression, but trigger far less or even no need for justification and because of this do not entail a loss of legitimacy. 
If, for example, the infant ward of a clinic is bombed, the outrage naturally is enormous. But if the same infants die because vital medicines are missing, are missing due to a sanction measure, a number of factors have to be added to trigger the same reaction. This also implies to the prevention or boycott of financial transfers for humanitarian purposes. These coercive measures always and without exception lead not only to an impairment of social well-being, but also endanger the health of those who suffer from the measure up to and including life-threatening situations. Sanctions kill, like Martin said. I would now like to describe the more procedural side of the case that the Eritrean Relief Organization in Germany, EHD, had to deal with in 2021. The bitter irony of the case was that it occurred, Martin already mentioned this, at a time when the sanctions imposed on Eritrea in 2009 had been lifted due to the general situation after the Ethiopian Eritrean Peace Agreement in 2018. Some three years later, sanctions were again imposed on Eritrea. Uh, John, you have told us the difference between the former and these ones. This time for alleged human rights violations during the armed clashes in the, in the Tigray conflict. These renewed sanctions were not yet in effect at the time our case boiled up. There is one more irony. On the one hand, Eritrea was harshly criticized by Western governments and media for its perceived overly strict policy towards NGOs that wanted to carry out humanitarian projects. On the other hand, however, in the case of EHD, which can be described as a grassroots organization in the best sense of the word, the blocking of financial transfers prevented urgently needed aid from reaching its recipients. This contradiction alone shows that the West was not at all concerned with ensuring humanitarian aid. Now, what had happened exactly? Martin had alerted me in the early summer of 2021 that all money transfers of the EHD had been put on hold by the DZ Bank, the second largest German bank, which was in this time solely responsible for foreign transfers from Germany to Africa. A lawyer's inquiry at the Z-Bank's head office in Frankfurt was initially fruitless. The design bank stated, I quote, we have a corresponding board resolution and we do not have to justify this at all. After initiating the next stage of escalation, the DZ bank announced that there was a suspicion of money laundering and therefore the transfers could not be executed. A quick search revealed that according to the classification of, I didn't know this before, but uh, now I know, the Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering, FAFT, of which Germany is a member, Eritrea is listed in the weakest risk category without any conspicuousness or special notes, meaning harmless. The justification was obviously pretextual. Confronted with these findings again, this time, the compliance department of the Z Bank replied that it was impossible, for them impossible to verify, A, whether there was any truth in the allegations against Eritrea, B, what effects the blockade would have on those affected, and C, it remains the case that decisions taken by the Z Bank for regulatory reasons do not require any further justification. Okay, this was the time when we announced both legal action and the involvement of the media. And then suddenly the funds were released. The previously blocked transfers were carried out in a few days. In this context, the statement of the Z Bank in its concluding letter is unmasking. It says, I quote, now the Z Bank, perhaps, we can ask for your understanding, however, that payments to Eritrea are not ordinary payments and that this can lead to disruptions in processing. To our knowledge, numerous banks have stopped payments transactions with Eritrea, ultimately also, if I may be permitted to make the remark, in order to avoid any trouble and risks. And it goes on to say, 
we can confirm that there was no suspicion of money laundering regarding the payments, but we cannot make any further statements. So much for the DZ Bank in Frankfurt, which otherwise emphasized several times that there had never been a decision by the board of directors to block transfers to Eritrea. The reference to this initial statement, which was part of the lawyer's correspondence, of course, of the DZ Bank must have been a complete misunderstanding. This small but revealing example brings three other aspects to the fore. One, the influence of US imperialism, whether exercised directly through the State Department or American banks or one of the many intelligence services, is apparently great enough to issue directives to the board of a leading German bank. And this in a situation where no sanctions are enforced at all. Two, the mere reference to Eritrea as a notorious problem case with the worst possible reputation is enough for a German major bank to impose payment blocks in anticipatory obedience, even if this puts humanitarian projects of a flawless grassroots organization at risk. And three, the sovereignty of the willing enforcers of sanctions vanishes very quickly if they can no longer act under the protection of anonymity and without any compulsion to justify themselves. Especially in the financial sector, the announcement of high profile steps is perceived as a looming risk that is better avoided. Let me draw at the end some conclusions. Both Martin and I are aware that these conclusions are initially limited to our individual case, but they may in whole or in part correspond to experiences that were made in other cases as well. Firstly, sanctions affect and permeate all areas of life, especially those of the weakest, most vulnerable groups. This is true even and especially when these spheres of life, as in the case of humanitarian aid, are light years away from the pretended reason, such as armed deliveries, etc., and thus have no justifiable connection to these sanctions. Secondly, sanctions are often enforced under the protection of anonymity, sort of out of the darkness. The advantage for the enforcers is that pressure for justification cannot be built up or can only be established with great difficulty because the accusations are hard to address. Thirdly, sanctions are applied even if their legal basis is completely unclear or of no such basis is claimed in the first place, often by way of anticipatory obedience so that one does not get into trouble. For this anticipatory obedience, one could also say overzealousness, it is enough that the own state or a powerful foreign government labels the state concerned as a bad guy. Fourthly, sanctions put the sanctioned country in the situation of a reversal of the burden of proof. Not those who impose sanctions have to prove their legality and legitimacy, no conversely. The sanctioned country has to prove that the allegations are groundless, which usually fails because there are no substantiated reasons for the coercive measures. And fifthly, sanctions not only cause great suffering for those directly affected and sabotage social development, but they also aim, as many of you have uh, explained before, at destabilization overall. This is, this is intended to create compliance, or if this fails to materialize, as is the case in Eritrea, to bring about further steps towards regime change. So much for our conclusions. As for the former US President Wilson quoted at the beginning of the report, we can state that his conclusion, you remember sanctions as a remedy that no nation could resist, has historically proven to be a misjudgment. Apart from Eritrea, other states, for example, Cuba, have successfully defended their independence against all sanctions for decades. This tribunal is the best proof that the struggle for a future without foreign domination not only continues, but that the balance of power is in a state of upheaval. 
we would like to thank the organizers for allowing us to contribute a tiny part to this practiced international solidarity and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dirk. Um, I do feel like I'm echoing uh, myself, but another excellent presentation. And I thought all of the presentations uh, brought different insights and unique insights that complemented each other very, very well. So thank you to, again to all of you for your presentations today. What I'm going to do now is allow uh, Mr. Elias Amari to pr uh, provide a few concluding remarks. He was our first presenter yesterday. He's going to wrap things up and then we're going to transition to the Q&A, which will be led by uh, my colleague and co-moderator, Jeremy Miller. Uh, Elias, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Navid. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Distinguished members of the jury of the International People's Tribunal on U.S. imperialism, sanctions, blockades, and unilateral coercive measures. Thank you for your patience in hearing out the testimonies of the 10 witnesses for Eritrea's case against U.S. engineered unilateral and multilateral sanctions and coercive measures. Though by no means exhaustive, you have heard of some of the human suffering, pain and hardship that these sanctions have caused, which is really the tip of the iceberg. We will submit further documents and records as annexes to what has been orally presented yesterday and today. The use or threat of use of force against any country, big or small, is a violation of the UN Charter and international law that should be condemned. These US sanctions against Eritrea that we have heard about today and yesterday are a form of aggression, economic war, meant to inflict pain and suffering on the Eritrean population. As such, these sanctions are a gross violation of human rights and crimes against humanity. The question is often asked, why these sanctions against Eritrea? Why such violence and hostilities? Various reasons are put forward, strategic objectives of a global hegemon, geopolitical rivalry between great powers and the drive to assert dominance, et cetera, et cetera. The real reason, however, is nothing else but imperial hubris. We often hear these days from the officials of US imperialism about, quote, rules-based order, end quote. The implication being, we make the rules and you either play by our rules or else. In the words of that ancient uh, imperial historian of the Greek city-state of Athena, Athens, Thucydides, it is, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. If millions of babies die as a result of these sanctions and millions more suffer and die slowly, the representatives of global hegemony say without bashing an eye and with a straight face, we think the price is worth it. As the late Madeleine Albright once said, when asked by a journalist about uh, sanctions killing uh, over 500 babies in Iraq. We think the reason of why Eritrea is facing relentless onslaught from US aggression is because of its vision. According to Eritrea's national charter, these are the six basic national goals of the Eritrean nation. Number one, national harmony, for the people of Eritrea to live in harmony, peace and stability with no distinction along regional, ethnic, linguistic, religious, gender or class lines. Number two, political democracy for the people of Eritrea to be active participants and become decision makers in the administration and conduct of their lives and that of their country with their rights guaranteed by law and in practice. Number three, economic and social development for Eritrea to progress socially and economically 
in the areas of education, technology, and the standards of living. Number four, social justice or economic and social democracy, equitable distribution of wealth, services, and opportunities, and special attention to be paid to the most disadvantaged sections of society. Number five, cultural revival, drawing on our rich cultural heritage and on the progressive values we developed during the long liberation struggle to develop an Eritrean culture characterized by love of country, respect for humanity, solidarity between men and women, love of truth and justice, respect for law, hard work, self-confidence, self-reliance, open-mindedness and innovation and creativity. Number six, regional and international cooperation. For Eritrea to become a respected member of the international community by coexisting in harmony and cooperation with its neighbors and by contributing to the extent of its capability to regional and global peace, security, and development. This is our new dream and vision. It is not an easy task that can be accomplished tomorrow or the day after. There is no doubt that it will require time, strong commitment, hard work, and continuous creativity. But there is no doubt either that it can become a reality. The six basic principles which can serve as guidelines for our activities, again, I'm quoting from the National Charter, are national unity, active public participation, the primacy of the human element, the linkage, dynamic linkage between national and social struggles, self-reliance, and last but not least, a strong dynamic relationship between people and leadership. Eritrea's National Charter adopted in 1994, three years after its independence, is its guiding vision, its declaration of independence and sovereignty. It is because of its unwavering commitment to these six basic goals and six <clears throat> basic principles that Eritrea is being punished through these unwarranted and unjustifiable sanctions. Thank you for organizing this International People's Tribunal on U.S. imperialism, sanctions, blockades, and unilateral coercive measures. Thank you for hearing about the suffering of the Eritrean people and their courageous, resilient, and defiant struggle for independence, social justice, and human dignity. Thank you for your solid for solidarity in providing this, uh, this forum, the International People's Tribunal, and hearing the case of Eritrea in defense against US imperialism. Awad Nahafash, as we say in Eritrea, or power to the people. Thank you. Uh, really, really amazing concluding remarks. Elias, thank you so much uh, for uh, you and all the others who were involved in organizing uh, this hearing. Uh, your work has been uh, crucial foundational to this particular hearing. So we really appreciate it. At this point, I'm going to transfer uh, moderating responsibilities to my colleague, Jeremy Miller, who's going to take over for the Q&A part of our session. Thank you. Well, I will start uh, by responding and concurring power to the people. Let's start there. Uh, I'm grateful. Uh, for Elias uh, and for all of our organizers and uh, witnesses, uh, everyone who has made the last two days of powerful hearings possible and uh, uh, grateful and humbled that I get to play this uh, small role in facilitating this people's process. Uh, as uh, Naveed just mentioned, we are now entering into the question and answer period of today's hearing. And uh, so the uh, just brief notes on the structure, how we'll do this. I'm going to uh, seek out questions from our jurists for today's hearing first. And uh, I would ask jurists to specify whether you have a question directed at a particular panelist, or if you want to just throw it out to whoever uh, uh, feels uh, called to respond. And uh, once we have uh, uh, Going through uh, uh, the, the questions from our jurists, time allowing, uh, we will turn to repertoires and perhaps uh, other members of the audience. There also, uh, I would note, there have been uh, a couple questions that have uh, been 
post it in our question and answer uh, digital box, and we will attempt to address those as well, time willing. Uh, so once again, many thanks to all involved, and uh, I would like to start with uh, Dr. Mohamed Tay. Uh, Dr. Tay, do you have uh, questions for our witnesses today? أنا لدي تعليق بسيط هو أنه يعني توصية بأنه عندما يعرف الشهود الذين سيدلوا بشهاداتهم أن يتم أن يوصوا بأن يتم التنسيق فيما بينهم حتى تكون الشهادات متكاملة بحيث أنه لا تتكرر الأمور وبالتالي نوفر شيء من الوقت لمزيد من الشهادات الأخرى هذا هذا واحد اثنان أنه الشهادات كانت جيدة ومفيدة و رائعة هذا استطيع القول لكن كان يعني طبعا نحن ننتظر انه سيجري تقديم المستندات والوقائع الى المحكمة حتى تستطيع ان تستخلص منها ما ارتكب اذا كان هنالك ارتكابات تستخلص الارتكابات وتوصف وبالتالي يجري تقييمها من الناحية القانونية يعني الاقلال اقلال من من التحليلات السياسية بحيث انه تقتصر هذه التحليلات على وضع الأمور في نصابها فقط ثم الاستكمال بطرح حقائق ووقائع واضحة وملموسة حتى تشكل لدى القاضي قناعة لا يبقى عليها الشك في حصول هذه الأمور أنا فقط أكتفي بهذا القول وشكرا uh, um, question or yeah. Hi, Jeremy. The question was actually translated in the English room. If you turn on the English room, uh, Ali did translate uh, Dr. Tay's question. It was more of a question about what kind of documentation and evidence uh, the witnesses will be able to provide to the tribunal um, and just emphasizing the importance of this, which of course is also being documented and collected at this time. But that was what uh, Dr. Tay was expressing uh, to the witnesses. And if anyone wanted to have any comment about the evidence uh, that they will be submitting. And uh, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, so would anyone like to uh, respond to uh, Dr. Tay's observations and uh, uh, questions regarding uh, evidence? Perhaps I can uh, weigh in on this. Uh, we are compiling uh, numerous uh, evidences or list of long evidences of the suffering, various cases. So we will submit them as annex uh, to, to the jury. Uh, in the interest of time, we just brought the, the most salient, the most uh, significant ones by way of example. I hope that does answer his question. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed Dai. Is there anyone else that would like to uh, respond to Dr. Tay's uh, observations or questions? Okay, seeing, uh, uh, seeing none, uh, before I move on to our next jurist, uh, Dr. Tay, did you have any follow-up uh, thoughts or any concluding uh, remarks that you would like to share? Dr. Uh, no, thank you. I will <clears throat> depend on what I will be sent to the tribunal in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tay. Moving uh, right along, I would like to uh, turn to uh, Eva Nanopoulos uh, and ask Eva if she has any questions that she would like to address to our panelists for today. Uh, Jeremy, uh, I think Ava said that she's having problems with her mic and, and, uh, and video so, or uh, camera, so she's going to provide her questions in the chat box and she asked that we move to the next person. Ah, wonderful. Thank you for the clarification. And uh, Ava, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties that uh, you are having, uh, we, we will attempt to field uh, your questions in this way as requested. Uh, okay, so uh, hearing that, I will move right along uh, to Charlotte Cates. Uh, Charlotte, any 
questions or observations that you would like to share with our panelists for this for today? Sure. Um, I have a question uh, for uh, uh, Rahel Sabhatu. Uh, first, thank you so much for your presentation on the issue of Eritrean National Service. And also thank you for sharing the uh, presentation from Susan Rice in which she extolled the benefits of national service. And of course, um, the United States is not alone in this regard. There are many US allies which have uh, an assortment of national service programs, including many of which are mandatory national military service programs. Um, whether they are for people of all genders or whether they are for men only, it is still the process of mandatory military service. For example, we see this in South Korea. We see this in, um, we see this in Greece, in the EU, in the very same institution that is uh, you know, imposing sanctions on Eritrea because it has a national service program. We view this and we can see this in, in places like Taiwan, which while a province, um, it also maintains a national mandatory military service program. And of course has a major uh, client military, is, is a major military kind of protectorate of the United States. Um, and so I, I just wanted to ask, I mean, particular, and, and, and also, the taxation issue that was mentioned before, of course, uh, the United States also maintains taxation on all of its citizens, which live outside the United States, absent some kind of revenue sharing agreement. So I, I just kind of wanted to ask for any further comments that you had on uh, essentially this policy whereby um, imperialist powers, colonial powers, powers in the imperial core are uh, essentially encouraged to have the same kinds of programs for their own development and citizens that countries like Eritrea are actually being subjected to harsh sanctions for, for pursuing. And if you had any you know, kind of thoughts or analysis on that, thank you so much for your presentation again and to all of the witnesses for your, your brilliant and insightful thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that very uh, uh, important question. When I started off my presentation, I, I my memory serves me correctly, I talked about um, delegitimization, right? Uh, and it's also been, uh, you know, other members of the panel have also brought up this, not just the subject of delegitimization, but also um, these, these paradoxes, right? Uh, you know, you're told the rules are one thing, and then uh, something contradictory, contradictory happens. Uh, you you try to follow the rules, and then the rules change. You know, sometimes we use the metaphor of the the goalpost. The goalpost keeps moving. And um, yeah, these uh, foreign policy uh, decisions of certain states, especially those situated in the West, um, are unfortunately full of these type of paradoxes. They will, uh, you know, change the rules or change norms um, as long as it suits their national interests. Number one, um, but two, in terms of like global interests and the colonial post-colonial line, you know, that, that that exists between, you know, the quote-unquote first world and the third world, or what we call the global north or global south. They will. This, these type of uh, political processes of delegitimization function so that um, it protects these, what I would call like, you know, kind of international or global political economy, right? Um, and that's where we get all of these contradictions. I think if the less than 1% capitalist class had it their way, um, any type of uh, exploitation that is legal or they would consider legitimate is only the one that they are able to do, right? Because this national service uh, uh, program in the Eritrean case, because mind you, Eritrea is not, an, it's, it's not a, uh, an imperial country. It's not, it, it's not invading anybody. Um, the, the whole system yeah. there, of, you know, in fact, it's called the Eritrean Defense Forces. It's to defend a country which uh, you know, always had this threat from um, the South, particularly Ethiopia, uh, with a very, much larger population than, uh, than, than Eritrea. 
Uh, and so uh, the, the reasons why it's there is, is quite clear, but it's because it creates this sort of national sovereignty, uh, synergy, uh, you know, self-reliance uh, and makes people, you know, think independently uh, in, in all aspects, they see this as a threat. Uh, and I think the only thing that will kind of remedy this idea of a threat in their eyes is, is it's, it's, if, it's only when they are able to exploit, right? They will frame the active participation of young people uh, as some type of exploitation, right? They use the word, you know, slavery and, and, and what have you. But if it was a case where insert whichever, you know, country, there's, there's so many examples uh, where multinational corporations are uh, exploiting people where, you know, we have this illegal uh, mining or, uh, you know, the, these, these industries um, that, you know, totally ruin the environment does not compensate people. When they do it, it's not, you know, considered a, a, a problem. Uh, so what should normally be, you know, in, which is in something actually practiced by many countries, uh, national service, uh, is delegitimized uh, just because of who, who we are. And because the actual practice in itself in terms of the legacy that it, it, that it instills on young people is one that will not allow them to be easily exploited by imperialistic uh, powers. Thank you, Rahel. Uh, I believe we now have, uh, uh, I believe uh, Professor Eva Nanopoulos has been able to return to the Zoom session uh, to ask her question live. I would just take this moment also, uh, in the interest of time, we have not given bios for our jurists, but for anyone that's interested in uh, finding out about our very uh, uh, erudite and esteemed uh, jurists, please visit uh, the website for this tribunal process. And that's very simple. It's www.sanctionstribunal.org. Um, that being said, uh, Professor Nanopoulos. Thank you so much. And I apologize for the, for the technical issue. Also, I haven't been able, unfortunately, as a result to hear the last witness. Uh, very well. It was interrupted, so so I'll I'll go back to the video. Um, I just have a maybe general question for whoever feels like making a couple of observations on that because it was quite interesting. And and already um, after a few hearings now, uh, the ones I've attended, there's a lot of narratives in which those sanctions, particularly U.S. sanctions, are are tied to sort of setting an example of some of these countries sort of thwarting the dreams of decolonization in a way. And I think a lot of you emphasized that, uh, particularly with regards to creating the possibilities for self-sufficiency and for cooperation between African countries. Now, I just, of course, this kind of moment is, is a bit far behind us. And I just wondered, if you had some thoughts, are the sanctions now in that regard, are, are they even reversible? Meaning if they were completely to stop uh, or regime, some regime change to be achieved or anyway, for some success to be achieved, um, is there any real prospect when it comes to Eritrea for the kind of policies it had in mind, the policy of self-sufficiency, the policy of African unity or is, has now the goal been achieved in that regard? Uh, I, Is there someone that, go ahead. Yeah. Um, in terms of reversibility or even in a case where they were able to, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, put in a government of their approval I, I don't, it's very hard for me to imagine either of those cases. Um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that, you know, a lot of these values or principles that they are against is not something that started overnight. It's not something that one 
political uh, leader has, you know, claimed and every, this had to do, this comes from a, a very particular history of constant, uh, um, the denial of the rights of Eritreans, the denial of the right to self-determination, denial to self-govern, uh, and it's all been done in the interest of imperial powers. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the fact that Eritrea is situated in a very strategic region, uh, you know, being in the Horn of Africa and having, uh, you know, one of the longest uh, coastlines to the Red Sea, also with the South being in the, you know, the Baba Mandeb, the, uh, the, the a way for many vessels, for instance, to go from Europe down to either South Africa, Southern Africa or, or Asia. Uh, so if there was, if any attempts for, I don't know, you could call it regime change or, or whatever, um, would not be successful because what we are talking about in terms of these values have been instilled through much, much sacrifice. Uh, uh, you know, shared uh, generational uh, contributions, but also shared generational traumas that come out of this because the, uh, because the agenda, the Western agenda for the Horn of Africa is something very different. Um, we can look at it from the case of other uh, countries in the Horn of Africa as well. You know, the divide rule um, tactics that have been, um, you know, used uh, within those countries, uh, the constant fueling of conflicts. Uh, this is something of, this is a bigger, uh, it's, it's, it's a bigger phenomena than just the US agenda to Eritrea in, in particular. And so when it comes to also reversing uh, the sanctions, I think if the world continues to uh, run through and, you know, these, uh, rules that are actually not rules of imperialist uh, ambitions, uh, reversing them could be very difficult, but of course the uh, world order is changing. More people are informed about their rights and uh, you know, even you know, mechanisms such as tribunal can play, do play a very important role in, in, in changing the narrative, in, in, in making people aware of uh, you know such political situations, uh, and so a change or, or what we call like a, a reverse of sanctions would actually look like equal participation of states and nations, uh, equal partnership, cooperation, and interdependence between countries. All of which are first uh, within the foreign policy um, of the Eritrean government, and that foreign pol that foreign policy actually stems from the Eritrean uh, National Charter. Like these are values and principles that have been instilled in uh, because of the older generation and uh, their path or their, their struggle towards making Eritrea independent. And also uh, for future generations, this is a national global uh, program that, um, uh, that also is part of the, um, uh, what we call foreign policy. Uh, one quick point, if I, you know, uh, despite the fact that um, there is a lot of conflict happening within the Horn of Africa, I believe that, I mean, so I don't, I believe, I know that when it comes to the Eritrean people and what they have gone through uh, in the past, present, and, and present, um, also in relation to the Eritrea Ethiopia peace deal, the tri, tri uh, apartheid uh, peace deal that was signed between Eritrea Ethiopia and, and, and Somalia, for instance, that the prospects of peace are there. The prospects of international uh, inter uh, country cooperation for development, for prosperity, all of that is there. And I hope that, um, you know, through the love and respect that we have with for each other in the Horn of Africa, that we will then be able to not just pursue a kind of regional uh, self-reliance uh, program as such, but something that would make us stronger, right? So that the such sanctions become either no more, uh, no longer viable, or that the imperialist powers will redirect their interests in a way that actually promotes peace, security, and development in the Horn of Africa.
Thank you, Rahil, for a, a very powerful answer to a critical question. I, I don't actually want to depart from this question just yet because of how, uh, how vital the responses to this question are, because it, it, it really sort of, you know, can be, can be boiled down in a way to what is to be done, right? And so to that end, uh, I would like to ask if anyone else would like to uh, weigh in on responding to this question, uh, perhaps Professor Sinai, uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Hassan, uh, Elias, any, if there's anyone else that wants to uh, jump in and, and offer any thought, any other thoughts in terms of reversing uh, the current status quo vis-a-vis -vis sanctions on Eritrea. I would like us to hear from uh, a comrade in Eritrea from, from the ground, uh, his perspective, if he's still with us. Is Dr. Sanai still with us? Is the connection still working good? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, a, a couple of comments um, by way of responding to that question. Uh, is this reversible? Yes, it is reversible, it, at least on, 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 on the level of possibility, because there, there were years when um, the United States and Eritrea had a relationship that you can call at least better than it is now. Uh, there were some, you know, um, levels of cooperation in, in many instances. So I do not believe that this is something that is that is permanent and, and irreversible. Uh, well, who should take the first move, Eritrea or the United States or Eritrea or the West? Um, well, it, that depends on, uh, on, many, on many factors. There could be some areas where we must admit, uh, given our situation, we are at, at a disadvantage. Or there, can, there are also um, areas such as um, the very fact of, 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 of justice where we might find ourselves on, on, on a better position. So one uh, recommendation I would like to make, and this is something that I have written um, a little bit about, is, is, is the good move that Eritrea uh, finds itself at now, slowly coming out of um, uh, isolation that is not as, as imposed as, say, in the United Nations. So Eritrea is, is better in, in its um, strike, if I may say, um, in the region than, than it used to be. Uh, such as, for instance, the recent move to uh, um, rejoin, if I can use that word, IGAD, because this is the same institution that was used to legitimize the 2009 sanction. So uh, that is, that's a good start. Uh, making use of um, institutions. I mean, not all institutions outside the United States and its circles are, are, are useless. I mean, we can use the African Union, for example, as, as a platform of, of, of influence. That is um, at least a, uh, a platform when we can have a better say than, for example, knocking at the door and at 1600 Penn Avenue, you know. So uh, this, is, this could be a, a good start. Uh, but also we should we should underline that at least in, prism, in principle, Eritrea has never uh, said that it does not want to have any relations or wants to stand at a hostile relations with the United States, nor has, nor has Eritrea selected as a partner any country that it thinks is against the United States. So this um, gives um, a, a, a good, background for Eritrea when it wants to, for example, engage at some level with the United States. Eritrea cannot uh, be blamed for siding with a country that the United States traditionally considers is against the United States. Uh, any uh, nation, as far as I know, have, has never been denied the opportunity to open an embassy in Eritrea, for example. We have a functional embassy at some level uh, of the United States in, in Eritrea. So we have some 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 notes of um, uh, relationship that, that that we can build on, if if it is Eritrea v the United States, but a platform such as um, you know the Horn of Africa now there is uh, an up and coming 
revival on, on both sides of the Red Sea. And we know that Eritrea has been more active in this area as well. Uh, so that can be a, a good uh, opportunity for it. I'm not a, a foreign policy expert, I'm a legal expert, but looking at, at it from, from the ground here, uh, I see that it is not as, it is painful, but it is not as hopeful, as, sorry, as hopeless as it might sound. But we also, uh, this might sound a bit wishful, we also um, have sometimes uh, a bit of a hope when, you know, a new administration uh, comes into uh, the picture in the US or in Europe or in this, uh, even in, in the Red Sea area. I mean, Eritrea has tried to, um, at, at the minimal level, make use of new changes, um, uh, but it, it has not uh, uh, proven very fruitful. But we, so, yes, there are some uh, uh, some hopes, but the best uh, say response that we can have um, uh, as, as as a country, as a nation, is to keep on uh, you know bridging the gap that is building uh, among and between air trends. Uh, that would be uh, that would be something that we can we can work on because this thing will be permanent. I mean, uh, uh, if if a bridge uh, gets wider and wi wider uh, between or among air trans, uh, even if um, the U.S. or, or or Europe gives some signals towards say mending the relations with Eritrea at some level, but that might become too late. So we also need, unfortunately, to look uh, inwards as well. Uh, there are lots of uh, good steps, good measures uh, being taken, such as, for instance, very recently, a number of uh, Eritreans who have, uh, you know, uh, illegally left the country and stayed in the Sudan um, came back. Uh, some of them came back, and they were not uh, received with. Uh, the otherwise expected harsh punishment, but they were welcomed and uh, you know asked to uh, to go back to the places where they used to be. They've been given some uh, papers to uh, uh, safely move around the country. So the government keeps on taking some um, laudable measures as far as um, the citizens of Eritrea are concerned. So here and there. Um, uh, there could be some some points for hope. Uh, that's what I can see from looking at the situation here from Asmara. Thank you very much, Dr. Sinai. Uh, just a little housekeeping. Here we are uh, running a little bit over time, but I would actually not like to uh, abridge this discussion as it is our final uh, day of hearings uh, for Eritrea. Uh, and to that end, um, I'm going to attempt to uh, field all of the question uh, requests that have come in various forms to me uh, uh, right now. And I'm just uh, being mindful of, of the fact that we're going across time zones here. I'd just like to ask as many of you as possible to, uh, uh, if it's okay to hang in with us uh, till the end of today's hearing. Uh, that being said, uh, at this point, we usually turn to our rapporteurs uh, for for questions. Uh, in this case, it is myself and Navid who was moderating earlier, and so I'd like at this point to ask uh, my colleague Navid if he has any questions for the panelists. Uh, Jeremy, I do have a question, and I'm glad to ask it. But I think uh, Helia also had a question. And I think uh, she she was sort of first in line, so uh, maybe we should go to Helia Batali, one of our other. Uh, rapporteurs and steering committee members. Of course, yeah. Uh, so we can turn, thank you, Navid. So we can turn to uh, Helia Dutai, uh, is a steering committee member, also one of the co-chairs of the International People's Tribunal. Uh, welcome, Helia, and uh, go ahead and please ask your question. Thank you all so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank um, all of our as speakers and witnesses today, both today and yesterday, it was truly an enriching session for me personally, and it was really insightful. Uh, I, I really appreciate all of you. 
Um, and my question, I have a couple, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm only gonna ask one uh, due to our time. Um, and um, my question is for Mr. Fairman, and um, I really appreciate your legal analysis, and I think it was very important. And as some of you might be aware, one of the um, objectives of the tribunal is to conduct litigations once we conclude in July. And that's something that we're pursuing and we are building these hearings and sessions uh, towards this goal, which is one of our goals. Um, you did mention um, that we, we know that human different human rights mechanisms, uh, UN Human Rights Council, for instance, or even the um, General Assembly have had uh, resolutions or um, the legal and international legal documents that either condemn sanctions, unilateral coercive measures, as is the UN language, or uh, they outright just deem them illegal in under international law. Um, my question is that we know that states, for instance, Iran very recently um, and others have tried to bring international litigations um, in different courts internationally. Iran used uh, one, one of the bi bilateral treaties that since US has withdrawn from on, for, for the basis of its legal arguments. Um, but we've seen this only being a state centric, the international litigations being led by the states. I would love to know your thoughts on the possibility of bringing legal, international legal claims and disputes uh, about these measures that are led by the movements and by the people and by the victims, as for instance, represented in, in this tribunal. And if you have any thoughts about some possibilities on this, on the international law, uh, I know you're an expert and we would be very enriched uh, to, to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much for, <clears throat> I think what is indeed a crucial question is, uh, is there any possibility to fight it within legal forums, established legal forums? Um, <clears throat> I would say that, that, that there are, of course, some possibilities. Um, sanctions taken by the European Union can be challenged in the uh, European Court of Justice, uh, but um, <clears throat> I think one of the problems we are facing here is that actually, um, as it was emphasized in different uh, presentations, uh, I would say the bulk of the, the, the main part of the sanctions are not formally adopted sanctions. Uh, it's what the banks do, it's what uh, transport uh, companies do, it is what uh, investors do. Uh, or don't do uh, because they are under pressure. They are under um, uh, yeah, under pressure by by or or, or simply afraid. You know? um, and so I think that is a more complicated question. Uh, we heard from a, uh, an example from Germany, which actually um, were actually the our German colleagues succeeded to. Uh, uh, push back the bank when the bank started saying we won't make any transfers anymore. And so I think there is this, I would say, micro level on which, uh, yes, there are possibilities. Whenever a bank stops a transaction, whenever uh, uh, there is a discrimination uh, uh, applied by a bank or by a similar institution, uh, there are a series of micro levels on which uh, one can act. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the German example is, illustrates that that can be successful. Uh, <clears throat> I think in some conditions, um, but I think there's more complicated with the with this EU sanctions now on uh, Eritrea, the, the official sanctions, uh, which are actually on supposed to be on assets, assets freezing and travel bans on individuals. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> That is, I think, a more complicated uh, situation where, of course, um, in, in, in some uh, situations where uh, the sanctions directly affect uh, the right to development uh, or the rights uh, of communities of uh, 
uh, or, or, or local communities to um, uh, development and to basic economic and social and cultural rights. Uh, and I'm, I'm, for example, thinking about cases of uh, reconstructions uh, in countries like Syria uh, uh, that have been through a war where the government and the local authorities have the obligation to um, um, actually to provide housing, to provide basic services to the people, and where uh, systematically the European Union is uh, uh, putting sanctions on everybody that is involved in reconstruction projects. Huh? Um, so I think that is a clear situation where, for example, communities from uh, uh, from Syria could say, hey, wait a, wait a second, we have an obligation to provide housing to our people. We have an obligation to rebuild the country. Uh, and actually, your sanctions simply stop us from doing so. And I think that could be an argument that could be used in, in, in certain situations. Huh? Um, I, I think in the precise case of Eritrea, it's a little bit more complicated because the formal sanctions that have been taken now, um, it, it's not the formal sanctions that are uh, harming the most uh, uh, the situation. It's it's the consequences of those formal sanctions, the informal consequences on banking, on credit, on trade, on transport, etc., which is much more complicated because then you have to go after uh, each of these actors almost individually to force them to. Uh, to, to stop uh, applying uh, these informal sanctions. But German, the German example, which uh, was explained by Dirk and uh, Martin, showed that there is a possibility uh, if uh, one reacts, there is a possibility to, to react and to win even those, uh, that kind of cases. So, but I think we should certainly think about how does it impact on uh, the um, social and economic rights, mainly of the people, and how can we make communities step in to say, hey, what you are doing there, the sanctions you are imposing upon our country, upon our leaders or whatever, are actually affecting our social and economic rights. So uh, uh, the countries that impose sanctions, they all signed and ratified the, the UN covenants. Um, and actually, by imposing sanctions upon all other countries, they are... Uh, Either directly or indirectly violating the uh, the rights uh, that are enshrined in, especially in the covenant on the economic and, and social rights, and I think that should be an angle which we should try to explore. But it's not an easy thing to do. If I may weigh in, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Elias, you're on mute. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, listening earlier to Dirk uh, and now to Jan, about this sanction and how they work, uh, you know, in the dark. I'm reminded of that uh, statement by Samuel Huntington, who once said that power, he meant imperial power, works best when it's hidden in the dark. So uh, I think our task is to bring uh, this, uh, the effects, the devastating effects of these sanctions and their operators who work behind the scenes in the dark to bring them forth to light. And I believe that, you know, the, the, this tribunal and things uh, exercised like this help to bring uh, the devastating effects of sanctions uh, to the light, to the awareness of the public. Uh, and thus, uh, you know, just like at some point uh, in, in the West, in Europe, in the United States, in the 70s and 80s when there was great mass movement against nuclear disarmament to some degree that affected uh, you know the policy change and some agreements between the two superpowers was brought about so uh, i think that that is one way to go besides uh, what ian articulated so 
I am hopeful in that regard. Uh, we have to be, uh, as Edward Said, quoting uh, Gramsci, used to often say, pessimism by intellect, but optimism by the will. Our, our will to struggle against this uh, illegitimate, unjust uh, sanctions, which in the end ultimately are a crimes against humanity. Uh, we we raise this consciousness and. Uh, and spread it around the world, uh, maybe in the non-aligned movement, maybe uh, at the United Nations, the, the group of friends in defense of UN Charter can take it up. Uh, and so in various uh, international fora in concert, if, if uh, things start working eventually, who knows, maybe we have a second Bandung of the non-aligned movement uh, uh, with, with, with this, uh, the driving force against these sanctions, blockades, and unilateral coercive measures, uh, change can come about. Change always comes about through struggle. Uh, you know, the case of Cuba, it's been over six decades, these blockades, uh, DPRK since uh, the 1940s. But uh, eventually, my, my hope is, my optimism of the will says that. Uh, uh, these sanctions can be reversed, not because of change of heart of uh, the imperialist forces, but uh, because of pressure and, uh, and struggle from below. Thank you, Elias. Uh, I believe that uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Hassan also wanted to respond to this particular question. Go ahead. It's a moment. Uh... My colleague, uh, comrade uh, Guruguar, yesterday he said that one of the major characteristics of propaganda of the imperialist forces in specific of the United States, from the five parts, he emphasized hiding history. In the situation of Eritrea, and Eritrea is sanctioned on the file which is engineered that Eritrea is supporting the Shabab. And the second is combined to that is Eritrea is threatening its neighbor Djibouti. The funny thing is Eritrea is accused by a document of the French and fascist Italy have signed in 1935. France was frightened that Mussolini will ally with Nazi Germany. Laval, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France in 1935, came to Italy to win the heart and the mind of Mussolini and sign an agreement, which is called the Laval Agreement. What does it mean, that agreement? That France will give Italy two specific areas as a reconciliation between France and Italy. When, if the, when they say that it is Italy, Italy constitute by that moment Eritrea, Libya, and Somalia, and Italy, proper Italy, Italy. And they have signed that agreement, which later on became nullified. And of course, Mussolini joined Nazis. This document, which is signed by the two colonialist and uh, imperialist forces, was smuggled to Djibouti. I don't know whether Dr. Salah is listening to me. In the Arab world, in one of the moral and probably even in the legal system, fitna. Fitna means you create hate among the society or among the family is considered a criminal act. 
the first thing you have to create the atmosphere of enmity among the neighbors. Djibouti and Eritrea, they were very good neighbors and there was no any contradiction among them. They smuggled that agreement, Laval agreement. They gave it to the leadership in Djibouti and they told them that Eritrea is claiming land from Djibouti. When the Eritrean government understood that, they sent the delegation to Djibouti. They told them this is a fascist agreement. The border between Djibouti and Eritrea is clearly demarcated by the colonial forces. We never existed at that moment. We don't claim any land. But that fitna, as Arabs, they say, it went in deep into certain segment of the Djiboutians. And it was used as a stepping stone to create an hostility between Eritrea and Djibouti. And that's why later on the imperialists use it as a means and later on er Eritrea is sanctioned in the name of there is a conflict between Djibouti and Eritrea. For anybody who wants to know about this, you can go to the internet and there was a journal, a French journal called La Métan, published about this issue in 1935. I'm asking one of the juries, Mr. Mohammed, when they can check in the internet and find this document and present it as one of forgery by, by using forgery, you create a big problem. The second is the same document. It created a war between Libya and Chad. If, if you are journalists, my comrades there, the best person to make an interview with General Haftar or the Field Marshal Haftar today. He was captured in the Libyan war between Libya and Chad in the time of Hussein Habre. This country is fought with a fake document, have no historical relevance. Imperialism means a forgery, liars, they can invent things on the ground. I hope a member of the jury will check this and to see that all diplomacy of imperialism, how it manufactures sanctions and war, and especially in the global south. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohamed. Uh, I would like to uh, turn again now to uh, Navid Farnia for your question, sir. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, my question actually dovetails well with the comments of the last two, uh, last, the last two comments is, uh, I think one of the things that I've gotten from all these hearings that we've had so far, um, and I have something that I truly agree with is that sanctions constitute a mechanism of economic warfare um, against a targeted population. And one of the things that I think I've also heard though, is that this economic warfare is very much supplemented by uh, psychological warfare, psyops, uh, propaganda campaigns. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Jan Furman, I think really referred to that well today in terms of talking about demonization, right? Um, and so I want to sort of ask you all, you know, what is the mechanism for sort of challenging this sort of psychological warfare, right? Because if, if psychological warfare is aiming to sort of generate consent among Western audiences for sanction, right? Um, perhaps then solidarity is the way to combat that. And I think that might address some of the questions about like, what is the point of this tribunal um, and, how, and how do we combat these kinds of sanctions on a sort of grassroots level, right? Um, so, you know, this psychological warfare, I think, and I would also add, is very much based in racism and xenophobia, right? So how do we address these kinds of questions and these kinds of contradictions that are imposed um, by those that those who are trying to um, you know, leverage their power? Um, and I think Elias said it well, it's quoting Huntington that power best operates in the dark, right? 
So how do we challenge this sort of hegemonic psychological, um, you know, uh, these psychological operations, so to speak, and as a way of then pr providing a, a more sort of comprehensive challenge against sanctions as well. Thank you, Navid. Uh, we have, uh, just for everyone involved, we, we have only a few more questions that we have uh, time for in the hearing today. I, I, I would just uh, add one of my own uh, uh, before we move to the, the uh, digital, the question and answer box, but I'd add one of my own and I would like to uh, address it to uh, Rahel. I thought uh, I, I really appreciated uh, uh, all the insight that uh, you put forward in terms of the national service, also in terms of dispelling uh, misconceptions about gender relations vis-a-vis -vis said service. Um, and, 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 and the way that you, you, you uh, highlighted uh, uh, other, mythology, other negative mythologies, such as uh, the, the weaponization of the so-called um, youth bulge. Yesterday, and I said it all as a, a, a uh, uh, introduction to, to the question, which is that yesterday uh, I, I uh, in, interrogated some historical uh, uh, U.S. Mech military machinations vis-a-vis uh, -vis Eritrea and, and pointed out that uh, one of the most significant uh, aspects of Eritrean foreign policy, I think, especially for Black Americans, is the stalwart opposition to AFRICOM, which is fairly unique on the continent. And I wondered if you could speak to um, the question as we as we envision uh, perhaps an Eritrea post-sanctions where we've overthrown such coercive measures somehow, uh, I wonder whether the uh, military and security independence of Eritrea, uh, do you think that that will always be uh, uh, a uh, a beacon for coercive external coercive measures? And uh, is there a way uh, forward in terms of uh, continuing to expand and export a, such a good model of self determination and uh, uh, sovereignty? Sorry, can you just repeat that last part of your, your question? I didn't, uh, maybe I missed. Yeah, just uh, the, the question was uh, uh, highlighting that, that Eritrea has, has put forward a very uh, powerful uh, 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 position of self-determination and sovereignty as regards uh, uh, security and military um, matters. Uh, and wondering, uh, you know, both, is this going... Do you understand this to be a perpetual hazard, like a perpetual beacon for for coercive measures such as sanctions? Um, and what does actually uh, spreading and expanding this sort of self-determined uh, model, maybe along the lines of, of, of what was theorized by Nkrumah so many uh, you know decades ago, what, what does that look like from uh, your perspective on the ground? Okay, yes, that's, that's clear. Thank you. Thank you for that interesting uh, question. Um, first, um, I think uh, I need, one thing needs to be made clear, yeah. The pursuit for self-reliance and self-determination does not mean um, either on, 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 on paper or policy and the way that uh, the Eritrean people kind of strive for this, yeah? It does not mean uh, any form of isolation. And in fact, uh, within the Eritrean uh, National Charter, it makes it very clear that, you know, we live in a world where we need to be interdependent on each other, right? Uh, and so um, in terms of uh, just security, right? Um, Eritrea's uh, right, of course, to defend itself, but also in ensuring uh, uh, security, Eritrea has in fact cooperated with other um, nations in, in the Horn of Africa, other countries. Uh, I think I should point out that, um, and this is also, this is both a reflection of inter, uh, uh, 
uh, interdependency and cooperation and helping another country pursue uh, uh, self-reliance. So um, I believe, uh, as far as I understand, the legend kind of goes, I haven't seen any like direct uh, um, like evidence of this. I didn't see this in like an interview or whatever, but uh, when uh, Fermajo uh, was in power in, in, in Somalia, he had asked uh, uh, for, I actually asked the Eritrean government for help to combat uh, Al-Shabaab. And instead of sending uh, uh, troops to, to Somalia, um, they had uh, helped train uh, uh, Somali young people, soldiers uh, to, to, to um, to do the security, yeah, right? to, to, to fight the, the the terrorism that has been, re, you know, ravishing uh, uh, the country. Um, so there is this these these, these possibilities for uh, cooperation, uh, uh, but it is also done in a way that becomes uh, that allows uh, a country like Somalia to become self reliant, and it's because of this cooperation too that we've seen a lot of very negative propaganda, um, you know, uh, even uh, peace security alliance between Ethiopia has been, um, you know, uh, said to be like one of the biggest threats. In fact, it was the, it was the peace agreement between Eritrea and Ethiopia and Somalia that uh, Anthony Blinken, Secretary uh, of State for the United States had said that it was a very, it was very problem problematic. That actually peace and cooperation was very problematic um, for, for, for the Horn. So uh, it's, there is, there's, there's, there are ways for us as people, as nations to cooperate uh, in a way that empowers each other, um, in a way that uh, allows for, you know, I mean, in the case of the Horn of Africa, uh, with a lot of like security threats, right? Uh, very direct security threats, uh, especially in the form of like uh, extremism uh, and stuff like this, terrorism. Uh, there's room for, uh, I wouldn't even say just a room for cooperation. If actually, I think it's, a, it's an obligation, right? If you're going to have a peace and secure region where the people are uh, you know, empowered to develop themselves, their families, their communities, you need peace and security. And in the post-colonial Africa, that we that exists today, where we know that all the borders were artificially manufactured uh, by by colonizers, um, to be able to have this cooperation with our neighbors is not is, is not uh, so much as a international relation, but it has it, it is within our interest. It is within our national interest that peace exists in the region because it has ramifications for for our own safety, for our own development. Uh, you know, you cannot, uh, you know, sleep at night knowing that your brothers and sisters, you know, are are going through like horrible warfare or they're being constantly threatened by terrorist acts. You know, we can look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the the things that uh, Al-Shabaab has done in uh, Mogadishu uh, or all, all of Somalia. We can look at what's going on in Khartoum right now, the internal conflict that's happening. It matters to us. Um, because we have this, uh, you know, these, these type of principles. And so um, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit. Did I answer your uh, uh, question or? You, you did, yes. Thank you very okay. much. For that. Okay, then it's not there. Uh, so we have uh, just uh, two more questions. Um, the, uh, uh, Jeremy, I think... I think uh, Dr. Muhammad or uh, Mr. Muhammad has his hand raised as well. I think he wants to address. Oh, excuse me. Um, so before we go to our final two questions, um, I, I'd be more than happy to uh, put on uh, Dr. Muhammad for, for any uh, response that you have. So please go ahead. I didn't raise my hand. It's a mistake. Ah, I see. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so then we'll move on to uh, our two final questions. I do want to uh, note that uh, uh, in the interest of time, th there's been a couple questions that have uh, uh, been put forward uh, by people relative to what 
the tribunal process intends to do about things. And I feel that uh, these have been uh, uh, adequately answered by uh, uh, both Helia and uh, Elias uh, to a certain extent. And so we're going to, uh, in the interest of time, we're going to skip over those. And I would just add that this is a, uh, an ongoing process. This is a living thing. And uh, we, you know, we're all engaged in this uh, uh, collective uh, liberation effort. And so it, uh, you know, there are the directions that are predictable now, and then there are the directions that may emerge uh, further on down the line. And I hope that answers uh, that question. Uh, to the uh, uh, penultimate question for today's hearing, uh, we had a, uh, a a question uh, slash uh, uh, a statement, uh, a testimony from uh, uh, Mabrak uh, Gebrueldi, and uh, uh, was uh, he says uh, uh, um, my account was also blocked for trying to send money to family to Eritrea from the UK. We the Eritreans are getting punished, harassed, and discriminated against by bank managers for only being Eritreans. This is the work of US and EU policy. Uh, against Eritrea, and uh, I believe uh, Dr. Sinead wanted to speak to this testimony briefly. Well, I I think it's more um, um, a personal testimony and uh, sort of a confirmation to what I said, uh, which Mabrab has just uh, mentioned then. Uh, a question I do not know if there is any question related to Mubra's personal testimony, but um, being in, in Asmara, um, I have many, many similar stories that I could share. Uh, uh, lots of friends, family members telling us that their uh, family member from Europe or the United States was uh, or is not able to send them money. Uh, because of, uh, I mean, a story similar to what has happened to uh, Mubra and even uh, uh, Professor Gideon was telling me a similar story that this is still going on in the United States as well. It's become very difficult for air trans to um, just transfer uh, $50, $100 to uh, a relative in Eritrea showing all documents. Even if uh, the, the beneficiary from Asmara could even show uh, a hard currency account in one of the banks in Eritrea. So even a bank-to-bank -bank transfer uh, is becoming difficult. Number one, at, at the root level, say you go to a, a local bank in, in Silver Spring in Maryland or in London, but also the, the process through which, uh, even if that bank were willing to transfer money to Eritrea, the link between the uh, Eritrean bank and that bank is effectively blocked um, uh, so say if if if, if i want to um, receive some money from uh, uh, elias or professor Gideon, even if their bank is willing to send the money release the money and my bank is willing to receive in asmara but there is no um, link and if there is a link between these two banks it is heavily monitored uh, so it is becoming practically impossible to to use the banks to transfer money from uh, anywhere to to Eritrea because usually this, as, as everybody here knows, these these transfers have they have to go through some system at least through the SWIFT system or through whichever system it is, which we know has uh, a lot of influence of the Americans on. So there is also that side on top of the um, effective impossibility of even approaching your local bank and asking them to send money to Eritrea. Thank you, Dr. Snipe. And uh, for our final question for today's hearing, uh, this question comes from uh, Theodros Mahari. And the question is, what the role of the, the United States administration on promoting, supporting, and enabling the Eritrean youth to leave Eritrea by, for example, a general asylum for anyone who claims to be Eritrean, and uh, why? And there was a request for uh, Rahel to answer this question. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible to quite a complicated um, issue. And it's complicated because describing how and why this is going on, it, it, it's a bit, um, it gives you like twilight zone vibes. Like you can't believe that it's, it's real. Um, uh, because it's full of uh, contradictions, paradoxes, and uh, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but it's been uh, something that the U.S. Uh, uh, government, especially through the U.S. Embassy, has been pursuing, especially for those who uh, have an education. Um, there was uh, really some years that they would give um, visas for them to travel to the United States. Um, of course, traveling, knowing very much that they will probably not come come back, right? It wasn't like they were giving, you know, uh, like tourism visas necessarily. Uh, you know, some of course could ha would have like scholarships to, uh, you know, to go to university to pursue their educations. Others not so much, um, and uh, and so they 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 try to catch them through that that yeah. We also know that there's been plenty of people who. Uh, do not have, um, you know, the the degree or you know work experience, whatever on on CV, who have tried to go to United States as well, uh, and uh, they've been able to enter through like the Mexican border or the Canadian border. Um, so at this, when you would have this policy of you know trying to make as many come as possible, and yet you would at the same time create barriers. Um, and they do this because it's not because they actually want to help these young people, you know, to to you know do better in their lives necessarily, or you know, they 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 claim that it's for human rights because human rights violations are taking place in the other side. They don't do it to protect their rights. Uh, uh, you know, once they get to the United States, the idea is that you will drain the you know country out of uh, of its most vital resource, and that is its young people. I should also add on that part that. Um, you know, uh, this Eritrea's young population is uh, a population that is highly invested on, right? We have um, free and universal education, for instance, that does not uh, come come cheap. I believe that there was even one of the uh, witnesses, uh, was it today or yesterday? I can't really remember right now, um, mentioned how, uh, you know, especially teachers that the government has had to have like higher uh, uh, teachers to fill in the, the gap for these things do not come in uh, cheap at all. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it does have a very huge negative impact on that. Another point I want to bring up is that because of this kind of general asylum for anyone who claims to be uh, uh, Eritrean, the Eritrean identity has become one of the most sought out identities. Um, Especially those who uh, uh, pursue, you know, uh, claim asylum in Ethiopia and were, um, uh, you know, in the uh, refugee camps in the northern part of Ethiopia, they have uh, gone through horrendous uh, situations. Identity theft was a very common thing. Or uh, they, you know, they would wait for uh, UNHCR to process their uh, papers, only to find out that once they're able to make this inquiry, that Technically, they are they are already in the United States or in Canada, and that's because somebody has stolen their uh, ID, their 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 identity, and uh, for the most part, it has been those who uh, reside in the northern part of Ethiopia. Uh, you know, there's different ways of, of course, you know, it's not just people seeking uh, asylum or, you know, might choosing to migrate to the United States. Europe has also been a very big uh, barrier. Uh, because of this general asylum uh, being granted to uh, Eritreans on the pretext of, they call it, you know, human rights or whatever. Um, uh, we have, and, and the Europeans know this just as much as Americans know this, that Ethiopians, Somalians, Sudanese, even those from Western Africa uh, have claimed to be uh, Eritrean because they know that's the only way that they can, they even have a chance, uh, you know, uh, on the shores of the Italy, Lampedusa, 
uh, you know, uh, people fleeing Boko Haram violence in Western Africa are not even given, uh, you know, a, a lot, given the right to seek asylum. They're denied that very right. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, because of the more grander foreign policy uh, decisions of, uh, you know, the imperialist United States, that is not the case for 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 um, for those who are able to claim that they're they're they're, they're trained. Not only did they get to seek asylum, uh, it, you know, things can comparatively speaking, right? Comparatively speaking to other, um, you know, Africans who have very legitimate reasons to seek asylum, compared to them, their their situation looks much easier. But it's still not easy. You know, many uh, Europeans, even the United States passport, right? You can vacation wherever uh, uh, you want, basically, right? You don't even have to ask for a visa. You pay, I don't know, from 200 to to $1,000 maybe. That's how you can travel and, and visit places. You can even work in other countries. Uh, that's not the case for uh, Eritreans and other African uh, uh, asylum seekers where they pay in the thousands. Um, especially after these, you know, uh, so much, uh, uh, I will call it political propaganda because that's what it was, yeah. A lot of uh, 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 a focus on Eritrean asylum seekers and them being uh, trafficked, you know, being victims of human trafficking, especially once that was used to, uh, you know, pursue further sanctions on, on, on Eritrea it actually uh, dramatically increased the number of kidnappings and the ransoms held for by those who were kidnapped by by human traffickers um you know we have you know cases of uh, you know people's organs being stolen um from them they're being trafficked for for their the organs uh uh you know we're talking about in the tens of thousands right it will cost a person tens of thousands of dollars just to make it to the shores of Libya where Fortress Europe has paid millions to make sure that uh, Africans cannot uh, reach its shores. Um, so it's, it's, it's an amazing uh, thing to, to look at because the intentions, the facts, all of it at the end of the day really it doesn't make sense. If you really cared about the human rights of people, you wouldn't make it so difficult for them to seek asylum. You wouldn't insist that they would have, you know, suffered in, in such, you know, a, a, a horrendous ways on this journey to, to seek a, a asylum or to seek a better life. Um, and then you do it in a way that, so you label the refugee, right? Uh, in, in the case of our region, you know, you have to be that an Eritrean refugee right, in order to be an actual refugee so that you can deny these human rights, the right to claim asylum for so many other people. Uh, and by the way, they, they, they know all of this. Let's not get it twisted. They, they know very well that, uh, you know, a very huge percent of those who seek asylum as Eritreans are in fact not Eritreans. Thank you very much, Rahel, for such a uh, comprehensive answer to such a very, very critical question. Uh, this will conclude the question and answer portion of our hearing for today. Um, and a few closing notes. Uh, I, I, there's a ongoing dialogue in our chat box right now regarding uh, other people that would like to present testimony. Uh, and we very much uh, welcome additional testimony and evidence. And uh, as was put in the chat box, if you are so inclined or have this to provide, please provide it to uh, info at sanctions tribunal dot org. And please share that with others who may be interested in this process. We want uh, our information gathering process and testimony gathering process to be as robust as possible. There was also a uh, a question I noticed uh, uh, towards the end about uh, the uh, removal of uh, SWIFT exclusions, uh, pushing back against uh, Eritrea's uh, 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 exclusion from, from, from money uh, or, or uh, uh, blocking from certain money transfer practices. And what I would say is this, um, we at the International People's Tribunal do not uh, wish to engage in the hubris of presenting ourselves as able to achieve 
certain political victories or things that we are not necessarily within the power immediately to do. But that being said, we are uh, committed partners uh, for the, the people of the, the nations that we are engaging in this uh, tribunal process and this uh, uh, liberation process. And uh, we will continue to do uh, everything in our power to stand as as comrades and and push for that better world that we all uh, know that we need and believe is possible. Uh, I will end it there. All power to the people. Thank you very much to all of our participants, our jurists, our organizers, and to uh, all who have tuned in to today's hearings. I'd like to encourage people to uh, continue to turn into tune in to our future. Uh, country hearings. And uh, this is a people's process. It, it is as powerful as the engagement of the people makes it. And uh, I can certainly speak for myself and, and for uh, my colleagues at the tribunal uh, and, and say that this weekend has been uh, extremely, extremely powerful and rewarding. And we are humbly grateful to all involved. Thank you very much. And have a good morning, afternoon, evening, based on wherever you are in the world.